Chapter 1. Billy's Big Dream. Billy was a good boy, like many others. He never bullied anyone at school. He always did well in classes. He was just an all-around good kid. He was popular, having lots of friends, and of course, young girls always uh, teased him as they wanted to kiss him and tickle him and be tickled by him. He loved the circus more than anything, and every conversation with Billy seemed to revert to something about the circus. How high the trapeze artists flew, or how mighty the elephants uh, seemed when they were being whipped. The only thing that uh, he didn't like were those scary clowns, but he could overlook those, uh, seeing as he loved the circus just so much. And it was always, with this kid, it always went to the circus. You know, he'd be talking about math homework. He had somehow managed to get on the topic of the circus. But it was fine, because he was so charismatic, and his friends all loved him. So, at school, Billy's teachers always had a warm look in their eye. A glimmer, if you will. When they looked at Billy, uh, because he, he always, they knew he cared about his grades. They knew he was a, a student student, a learned individual. They knew he cared about schooling. And he did his homework promptly, even though uh, he may not have been the brightest in the class. Now, Billy's favorite subject was easily math. He was attracted to the logical precision and the cleanly order of the mathematical structure. There was no ambiguity, uh, only cold machine precision, uh, which is what Billy liked a lot, as it reminded him of the circus. Billy had an appreciation for these mathematical things. He thought they were fascinating and fantastical, and he maintained a notebook that was as broad and as deep as the notebook of Leonardo da Vinci, with backwards handwriting and all sorts of fanciful diagrams. That said, he was never a math whiz. In fact, he barely passed addition and subtraction. Division and multiplication were well beyond Billy's means, intellectually and he just didn't have the tools upstairs. However, he managed to pass multiplication and division thanks to memorizing all his tables in grueling after-school study sessions with Mr. Myth Teacher, <clears throat> whom Billy quite liked on account of Ms. Mr. Myth Teacher's gentle nature. No matter how many times Billy failed a problem, Mr. Myth Teacher never used violence or humiliation to train Billy. Instead, he only used love and kindness, circus analogies, and the occasional sweet treat. One day, during homeroom, Miss Tetcher had everybody stand in front of the class with their hands at their sides and announce what they want to do with their lives. She told everybody that what they choose to do with their lives at this tender young age would indeed affect them later in life, and actually come true. Young Petter said that he wants to be a soldier, firing a big, powerful gun, and dressing sharply like a strong young lad. Jonathan said that he would like to become a great and important thinker, with lots of credentials, so that he can help the world see what is right, and help everybody see the error of their ways, and help them envision a brighter future. Miss Tetcher said that this was very ambitious indeed. Sarah said that her dream is to have lots of babies, lots and lots, an endless stream of babies. Everybody was really happy to hear this because they always thought Sarah would make a good mommy and that she has lots of good DNA and should pass it on to the next generation. Then it came Billy's turn to expose himself in front of all these strangers. He was red in the face per, uh, because he knew that if he spoke the truth, it would sound absurd, it would sound like a crazy person. Perhaps this absurdity would be met with laughter and derision, uh, or maybe they would all just kill him. But in any case, to tell the truth uh, out loud it was totally off the table. He knew that there was no way that could be done. So thinking quickly, doing his best to appear sane, Billy said, uh, I would like to be a soldier with a big gun and lots of sparkling badges on my chest. And of course, everybody clapped and hooted at Billy's uh, sensible aspiration. They were happy with him. But deep down... Billy boiled. Chapter 2, Billy's Big News. 
Later that night, Billy's mother came in with scented massage oils and all kinds of sugary treats to help Billy get off to dreamland. He was in no mood for such trifles, however, and he shooed his mother away with a flick of his hand. He curled himself into a tight ball and tore at the blankets quietly. His nails hurt. His eyes throbbed. He relived his classroom performance with a thousand different endings. In some endings, his classmates kicked him and screamed in his face after hearing his weirdness. In, no in another, he closed his eyes and swung his fists savagely, giving anyone who got in the way a good knock. In another, he cried and cried until the police came and locked him up for blubbering. And then in one of Billy's dreamlike musings, all his faceless classmates clapped and hooted for him. They poured their love into him. It was so pure. Miss Tetcher was beaming the warmest smile and hugging everybody because Billy had self-actualized and become more than a man. Billy was a man, but he was a man of his own design. A man not on anyone else's terms but his own. I'm God! I own this! This is my world! I'm God, bitch! He screamed, beating his chest. He held his trophy high and said, my life goal is to go to the circus. At last, Billy was able to smile and fall asleep. He wasn't man enough to tell the truth in real life, but at least he could speak freely in his dreams. The next day at school, there was a big crowd gathered around. Some were whispering. Most were yelling, yelling like apes and getting quite rowdy. Billy grabbed hold of his best friend Petter by the arm and drew him aside. What's going on, Billy asked. You dolt, Billy. You mean you don't know? I swear to God, man, you must have mashed potatoes in that big head of yours. How come you got such a big old noggin if you're so slow? I thought big heads were supposed to be smart. Pay attention, you dummy. It looks like there's some kind of big circus coming to town and everybody's excited, Petter replied. Petter pulled away with a spiteful glance at Billy and dashed off, joining the fracas once more. Billy stood motionless, his jaw dropped on the floor, and his eyes began to sparkle like the most expensive diamonds. This was it. This was Billy's moment to do what he had wanted to do for so long, to finally go to the circus and have a good time. He was so sure that his life was only ever going to be pure hell, but today, he felt sunshine through the clouds. He knew that there was a God after all, that there was a heaven, and sometimes, even though life can seem like a hell, you can get what you need to get by. The whole rest of class, the whole rest of the day, uh, Billy went from class to class with a blissful, blank look on his face. In sociology, they all learned how important prison is, in math class, uh, <clears throat> the teacher talked about how to survive on less than a dollar a day. In science class, they talked about all sorts of exotic poisons. All these things are things that Billy would typically, uh, he, would, he would be wrapped. Very interesting topics to him with his Leonardo da Vinci-like intellect. But today, they had no effect on the lad. <clears throat> Instead, Billy traveled the world in his dreams up here. He envisioned a perfect land of circus fancy. Only in Billy's fantasy circus there were no clowns. Everybody in the audience was laughing and cheering, screaming at the top of their lungs for the circus to never stop. Elephants charged out in regal adornment. There were lions and of course men whipping the lions nonstop to make them dance and play. It was just a fantastic scene. The circus tent was as big as the world. It wasn't just a three-ringer. This one went on forever and ever. And in each ring, a sight more fanciful than the last. Men in top hats and elegant tuxedos barked orders down megaphones. Lithe young bodies swung from the rooftop on trapezes made of gilded metal and lacquered wood. There was a whole squadron of Eastern European adolescents whose creamy flesh radiated heat and life as they all slithered around like a pile of snakes. 
Then he snapped out of it. A bell rang somewhere. School, yes. Back in school. The day was done, and every second of time passed meant that the circus was that much closer. Billy gathered his books and his clothes and walked home. Chapter 3, The Beginning of the End for Big Billy. Billy's mother was a good one. She never drew attention to Billy's lack of intelligence or his seeming inability to, inability to get anything right, and she always made sure that there was something yummy to eat. Tonight was no exception. The table was loaded with hot goodies, all steaming on sterling silver platters under glass. Some of Billy's favorites fried chicken, pizza, and of course cookies. He rubbed his hands together greedily in anticipation of the feast. Once his mother took a seat and they had both said grace, it was time to dig in. Billy started with some nice healthy pizza. His mom always made the best fresh hot pizza and tonight was no exception. He almost burned the roof of his mouth on the scalding cheese but luckily, he doused his gullet with ice-cold soda just in time. The combination of sweet soda and salty cheese activated pleasure centers that Billy didn't even know he had, and he belched appreciatively. Billy's mother gave him a stern look, reminding him not to belch at the table, but she knew he was in hog heaven right now and not to be interrupted with such silly reprimands. She loved feeding him and loved making him happy. She lived vicariously through him in many ways, and in knowing, uh, knowing that he was well-fed, nourished her soul in a way that food could not. Billy went in for another handful of candy, and she smiled. So, anything interesting happened at school today? Yeah, Mom. The circus is coming to town. I can't wait to go. It's all I can think about, replied Billy. Billy's mother grew silent, cold. The warmth drained from her face, and her smile disappeared. But Billy, we had an agreement. You're only allowed to go to circuses if you have good grades, Mom said dreadfully. Billy looked down at his report card, which was on a silver platter in front of him. There, in big red bold letters, were his grades for the year. D, 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 and in math, an F. He gulped, and the scalding hot pizza cheese now felt like slick vomit in his throat. The aftertaste taste of root beer was oppressive. It felt like a death sentence in his mouth, in between his teeth and under his gums. Billy shuddered as an arctic chill overcame his whole body at once. A million years could have passed in those brief seconds. But, Mom, Billy whispered before his voice turned into a dusty rattling and his stomach tied itself into a pretzel. He knew there was nothing to argue about. The agreement was signed in blood, and his loving mother had done nothing but give him support and affection and uphold her end of the deal. Billy had squandered that most precious resource, time. Instead of studying, he played silly games. Instead of practicing and memorizing, he dawdled outside in the sunshine and whistled cute mel melodies to himself. He was given such gifts by God, he could have risen to the greatest of heights. He could have invested money in foreign companies and already had been ready to retire at an age where his compatriots are struggling to find their first real job. He could have trained his mind and body to become the greatest fighter a champion unrivaled by any other, using devastating kicks and whirlwind blows to topple beast men in the great arena. A hard life for sure, but one with many rewards. He would have had women fawning over him, prostrating themselves for the chance to experience his gladiator sweat. Billy could have started a company, started his own business, and learned the hard way what it takes to make it as an entrepreneur. He would have built this company by hand, with only a few employees at first, growing with shrewd decisions and maybe some luck, eventually being bought out by a huge multinational for a tidy sum. But instead, Billy had led the life of a Dauphin. Dauphin. 
idle, hedonistic. It had made Billy fat and lazy. Like the YouTube user vomited shit who is probably typing a comment right now about my facial hair. In order to survive, you need to be lightweight, agile, ready to tear someone's head off or live out of your car for a few months if need be. Billy was no such animal. Comfort, free time, the things we take as luxuries Billy had come to take for granted. And now, it was all crashing down on him like a house of cards. Cards made of steel. Steel that was sharp. He was unable to muster any words. Without so much as a glance toward his mother, Billy trudged off to bed, staring a thousand miles away and whispering nothing in particular to no one. <clears throat> Chapter 4, Billy's Big Black Cloud. The next day, Billy went to school again, absolutely sick with grief. All his friends knew there was something wrong with him, and they all knew it would be better not to awaken whatever rage was lurking by trying to help him out. They all kept a healthy distance, and that's the way Billy wanted it. He sat through all the same boring classes. In sociology, the teacher was talking about how all the races are equal and the differences are just cosmetic. Some elementary level nonsense that Billy felt anybody with two eyes should be able to deduce on their own. No help from a teacher necessary. In math, the professor talked about how breaking things can actually help the economy because of the jobs created fixing what was broken. This is a topic that Billy usually gets excited about and agrees with. But today, he just couldn't get out of, out of first gear, mentally speaking. Then, lunchtime came around. Today was spiced candy and hot soda day, which was usually Billy's favorite lunch day. There was a long table set out in the cafeteria with a fine white cloth draped over it. The table was so long that if you stood at one end, you could barely see the other. It was loaded to capacity with silver platters and silver serving bowls, all full of one or another variety of delicious delectable. Tall bun coffee machines brimming with syrupy soda were set out as well. At the bottom of each bun coffee machine, the rubber nipples that dispensed soda were dripping and pulsing, ready to be tapped by the lucky boys and girls. Now, this extravagant affair usually would pique Billy's curiosity at the very least. In fact, some days he'd be foaming at the mouth and chomping at the bit, ready for some of that sweet, delicious candy. But today, the feeling just wasn't there. It had been over an hour since breakfast. Normally, he would be, he would be famished. But for some reason today, the candy just didn't have a good taste. You know how some days the candy doesn't just, it just doesn't taste good when you eat, when you eat some candy? And it doesn't, it's not as sweet as it should be. The piping hot soda felt lukewarm to him. His heart just wasn't there. Billy sat like a black cloud at his usual table, surrounded by friends who were all laughing and stuffing themselves full. Billy wanted his friends to notice him pouting and fawn over him. He wanted their day to be ruined as well. He wanted anything, some sort of attention. But they would just not acknowledge the funk that he was in. They kept laughing, tossing jawbreakers into each other's mouths, and catching them, playing and tickling, pouring hot soda everywhere. Now the whole time, Billy's mom had been watching the events of the day through a wireless webcam that she hid on Billy's shirt collar. Billy didn't know it, but all his pouting and belly aching and blubbering, all his pain and anguish, his mother had been watching right alongside him. She was a stern woman and she always stuck to her guns when it came to the rules. But she also had a big heart. A big one. Big. And when it came to her son, she would do anything. She would do absolutely anything for her son, no matter how degrading. She cried tears of pure sympathy watching Billy get along so painfully that day. She was crying watching Billy through that hidden webcam. She felt his pain. Billy carried on as one does after some major tragedy, smiling a hollow smile, walking slowly, feeling numb and cold all over, going through the motions but dead inside. A young boy should never have to feel such pain. He shouldn't even be aware that such pain is possible. 
the pain of a miscarried child, the pain of losing a loved one to a grueling battle with cancer. That day, Billy joined the ranks of the fallen. He went home, sitting at the back of the bus, away from his friends. He sat with his head down and his hands on his lap. Gone was the jubilant, boisterous lad that had once terrorized the other boys on the bus with boogers and noogies and all sorts of boy play. Now there was just a strange kid there, one whom nobody wanted to talk to or look at or have a laugh with. And all throughout, his mother watched on the webcam streaming from Billy's shirt. She saw the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations of the young lad, whom she had raised so gingerly. She understood the gravity of this moment. She understood that if she didn't act, Billy would be broken forever. She had visions of him growing up in a home for juveniles, being subjected to all the weirdnesses that young delinquents partake of, strange games in the showers and under covers at night that nobody should play. She knew all this because she used to run a juvenile home called Lord of the Flies Home for Desperate Tramps back in Cleveland, Ohio. And so she acted. She did the impossible, bending one of her own rules to save a boy's life. When Billy gets home, he'll be in store for the surprise of a lifetime. Chapter 5. Billy Catches a Big Break. Billy slammed the giant, ornate brass doors behind him spitefully as he walked in the grand foyer. He stomped across the marble floor and started up the carpeted, curving stairway with the sculpted mahogany banister when his mother appeared wearing an expensive and elegant gown and stopped him. Where do you think you're going, young man? The words young man were emphasized so as to be electric, and they made Billy get butterflies in his stomach and think of stockings. <clears throat> I'm going to my room. There's nothing in this world for me, so I may as well die, Billy replied, 100% serious. Not so fast. You've got quite a bit of homework waiting for you in the den. Homework, 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 said Mother. What? I've already got all my homework from school, objected Billeth. Well, I special ordered more from you from the website, and it's arrived. Better get to it before it gets too late. Billy slumped to the floor in agony. His skin felt like it was on fire and covered in ice. He looked at his Breitling Chronomat 44. It was already after midnight. Somehow he had blown the entire day and for a moment he racked his brain trying to imagine how. How would he let all the hours slip by, just like his life had? He had laid in bed for hours, he knew that, because he was sore in the spots that were touching the bed, and on top of his back it hurt like he'd been kicked by a black football player. He used what little brain power he had to make a mental note about time flying when you're miserable, and he returned to laying in a pile on this first step of the staircase. His mother, with eternal patience, watched Billy, her arms folded across her big chest. Tisk tisk, now you go in that room and get to doing your homework, and I'd like to see some enthusiasm. I want you to enjoy this, because I sure am, mother said. Billy picked himself up somehow. Picking himself up from his own funeral pyre of self-pity was the hardest thing Billy had ever done or will ever do. It was harder than lifting 400 pounds overhead. It was harder than painting a masterpiece painting. It was harder than the lifetime of work necessary to appreciate fine living and enjoy things like fine cigars and pipes and Ferraris. It was harder than diamonds, yet Billy somehow managed to stand up like a human being again. Somehow he found the strength pull himself out of his depths.
In the den, waiting for him, was a silver platter. He bet his life there wasn't candy inside. On it, in a, a single envelope, most assuredly containing the dreaded homework that Billy's mom had ordered custom from a website. <clears throat> the TV was in the den, and it was off. Billy looked at the dead television and remembered all the fun he'd had once. He imagined playing snowboard games, using his body to sway with the rhythm of an incredible snowboarding challenge. He would customize his board, spending real money in exchange for in-game money, and then use that to buy the fanciest, most expensive add-on parts, all in an effort to make his snowboard faster and more agile. He'd spent over $700 in real money, but it was all worth it to him because his board was fully equipped with the latest custom carbon fiber rods, sleek aluminum accent pieces, and topped off with glistening candy paint with a racing stripe. <clears throat> it was a red board with a blue stripe, and Billy even named his board. He called it the Dominator. He would play challenging maps, the hardest maps in the game, with rivals from online, men whom Billy had never met in real life, but wanted to maybe one day, would battle Billy for golden trophies, and Billy dominated all of them. That's why he called his board the Dominator, because he dominated every aspect of the game, whether it was pre-game psychological warfare in the chat rooms, uh, or dancing through the snow like a wintry god on his mighty board. Billy dominated. <clears throat> Those memories were trash now. All of Billy's memories were trash, and soon Billy would kill himself just as soon as he finished his homework. The thought occurred to Billy that his life was such a dead end and that as a person he was so ineffective and stupid that all of his memories, even the most pleasurable ones, and maybe you've had this thought yourself, were meaningless. Not only meaningless, but something about them felt dirty. His self-worth was so low Billy thought that a piece of dirt like him doesn't even deserve to have memories. Billy thought about it for a moment, verifying and double-checking that his logic was correct, and he nodded his head, agreeing with himself that what he actually deserved was to be kept in a small cage, being hit and hurt all day by bad men. All those memories of snowboard questing, all the delicious pizza and cookies and candy that his mom made for him, those were the memories of a prince or a king. Billy was no king. Billy was a dumb animal, he thought. He wished more than, any, than anything that aliens would beam down and use a brain sucker to remove all his good memories and leave him with only the bad ones. All this time, he was inching closer and closer to the homework without thinking about it. The game show buzzer had gone off. His pity party was now over. It was time to face the music. His mother watched and tried to stifle a smile knowing full well what would come next. She was about six feet tall, and her gown was electric blue. She appeared to float on air, and her smile glowed brightly. Billy reached for the envelope. He closed his eyes and imagined standing at the edge of a steep cliff, looking down, down at the rocks below, and flying to them as fast as possible. He opened his eyes again. No such luck. Here was reality laughing and spitting in his face. He gulped so hard, it felt like he was swallowing a crab apple whole. The envelope was damp, and it sagged in Billy's fingers as he picked it up. He used one of his long fingernails to slice, slice through the paper. Inside, there were two small red pieces of Bristol board. These were unlike any homework Billy had ever seen. What kind of devilish homework had his mother found to torture him with? Go on, pull them out, his mother said, barely holding back laughter. He did so. And out came two tickets to the circus. Plot twist. Billy immediately kneeled, keeled over weeping. 
His mother stood on her tiptoes and clapped her hands. She ran over to the lad. Billy was weeping uncontrollably and nearly foaming at the mouth. His chest felt like a thousand fire fairies were dancing in it like an ancient lantern. This can't be reality. His mother must have played some sort of cruel joke on him. Could it really be? Was she truly allowing him to go to the circus? He looked up at mother and knew instantly that it was not a prank. There she stood, her face beaming divine golden sunbeams of obliterating kindness. Billy melted into the carpet. His body was no longer in his own control. He was a handful of warm putty in his mother's hands. Mother laughed, then kneeled down to pet him and wipe his tears. Chapter 6. Billy gets ready for the big time! The following weeks leading up to the circus were something of a whirlwind for Billy. He did very well in school and had lots of fun with his friends, but all of his memories from that period blurred together like different flavors of ice cream, all melting together. The sole focus of his every waking thought was the circus. He imagined the graceful sky dance of the trapezists, swinging to and fro. He could see in vivid color the brightly quilted magic coat that the ringleader would wear. <clears throat> he smelled fresh hot peanuts, peanuts, wafting in from every direction. The circus was weeks away, but in his mind, he was already there. Then the day came. Immediately upon waking, Billy could feel electricity crackling in the air. Something was up. The satin sheets on his bed felt like a thousand well-trained fingers massaging him as he slid out gracefully to face the day. He breathed deeply, knowing that today would be the day that he'd been waiting all his life for. Today was circus day. Billy stood there, inhaling and exhaling with all the poise of a yoga master as he let the morning sun rays warm up his bare chest. He knew full well that life was full of good days and bad days, and he wasn't under any sort of delusion that the rest of his life was going to be all roses and candy canes from this point forward. He was simply a man, a boy rather, as he was still only seven years old, easy as it, as it is to forget that as mature as Billy was, uh, who understood that life comes in all flavors and it must be enjoyed like a fine cigar or a pipe, slowly and tranquilly. He looked at the photo of his father on the nightstand. Dad was a ruggedly handsome man who would have been proud of that little lad, Billy. Billy kissed the photograph and said a silent prayer for his father, who was away at the Great War. It upset him not having a father figure around, but at the same time, it felt good knowing that Dad was doing his part to make the world better, and also that Dad wasn't a coward. In fact, far from a coward, Billy's father was a general. He looked around the room some more, as if he were saying goodbye. Or maybe it was hello for the first time. <clears throat> he had all the latest designer toys that a young lad could want. There were all sorts of dig digital distractions and pixelated playthings, plenty to keep a smart young fellow entertained. He liked these games because they got his gears turning upstairs, you know, mentally. True. There wasn't much food for thought in the real world or in books or anything. Just lots of boring humdrum, same old, same old. But in virtual reality, the playground of the mind, he was able to flourish. Today, however, there was something in the real world that was just as interesting as his Brainiac games. He looked over at his, at his shelf full of coloring books. God knows how many hours Billy had spent painstakingly coloring in those beautiful images. Heck, each one looked like a, a diary from Michelangelo or Leonardo himself. He was quite handy with a crayon or a marker. In fact, some of his colorings were so good, they could have gone in a fine art museum. 
Billy viewed such simplistic two-dimensional doodling less as art and more as a therapeutic exercise. In fact, he held all two-dimensional art in low regard. To him, it was just a bunch of paint and ink on paper, nothing to be so proud of. The fact that his own skills rivaled any top artist didn't change his opinion. He was intellectually honest and held himself to the same standard. In his eyes, true art must encompass all five dimensions. The three physical ones, the fourth one, time, and the fifth one, user interaction and replay value. He had played video games that moved him more than any symphony or great cathedral ever could. He knew that even the greatest film ever made couldn't hold a candle to a me even a mediocre game in terms of fun factor and character customization. Nevertheless, the coloring books were a fun time. Today, however, there was something else on his mind. His gaze turned to the lone circus poster on the wall, and he remembered that today would be the day of days. He felt alive, as if God himself were breathing life into his mouth. Kind of like he was smoking a spiritual plant that God had planted in the ground. God's plant was a gift that allowed the mind to open and flourish and made you smarter so that when you smoked it, you were able to see God and communicate with him. He was, a, he was thankful, a little nervous, uh, and most of all, he was full of relief. Time to pick out a cool outfit. Choosing clothes was never Billy's strong suit, and it didn't help that he had so many of them. Billy's dad was a general, and generals have to dress sharply, so of course Billy had some walk-in closets of his own. He paced back and forth along one of his suit racks, running fingers over the fine fabrics, picturing himself starring in the next James Bond movie. Billy didn't own any Armani, because Armani is cheap trash. Glitzy bozo suits for Italian wop dagos who want to look richer than they are. Italians were always posturing and peacocking, buying Lincoln LSs and Bulova and Movado watches. Italians don't care if the materials and build quality are poor, as long as it looks shiny and expensive. That's why Billy always equated Italians with black people in his head. Even though Italians hate blacks, they're so similar. They love cheap, gaudy jewelry. They dress poorly. They drive flashy, unreliable cars. They are loud and obnoxious and prone to violence. That's why Billy didn't own any Armani suits. In fact, he didn't own a single garment that you could find in a Nordstrom's or a Brooks Brothers or any sort of retail store. Billy knew that the clothes make the man, and the man isn't a gentleman unless he gets his suits tailored for him on several... Savile Row. Thanks to his father being a famous and successful general, Billy was allowed to live a life with certain benefits, and custom-tailored suits of the finest linen was one of them. At age seven, Billy was too young to smoke, but he did have a giant walk-in humidor in his room stocked with Havanas, La Perla's and San Cristobal's to be specific. He couldn't smoke them yet, but he loved the fruity smell and sophisticated aromas of these fine tobaccos and the pretty ladies on the wrappers. The humidor was bigger than the main part of his bedroom and it made him sneeze constantly, but he loved it because it reminded him of his father who always had a big one in his mouth. Billy decided to dress circus casual that day. He put on a nice pair of Abercrombie cargo shorts and topped it off with a sweater also from Abercrombie. He sprayed himself a few times with Abercrombie cologne because he wanted to smell good for the ladies. But it was also nice just to smell good and enjoy the smell yourself. It's luxurious. He wasn't a fan of his natural body scent. It was a bit yucky, especially after not showering for several days like today. So he thought Abercrombie hums sweet aromatic hints of sandalwood and cool aquatic breezy hints of sea peach would be a nice diversion from the salad dressing crotch. The circus poster called to him like a Mayan obelisk. It was time. Billy said a prayer, thanking God for blessing, 
and also requesting that the rest of the day go smoothly. God said, you're welcome, but Billy, but told Billy that nothing is promised and that he should live each day uh, as if God were watching. Billy prayed back, saying that he understood and that he loved God very much. Then Billy jumped onto the brass fire pole and slid down three stories to the garage. Chapter 7. Billy needs a big ride! Billy's mom had said that since today was a special day, he gets to choose which car they drive. He loved when he got to choose. It always meant that the day was a very special day indeed. Billy surveyed the massive airplane hangar of a garage and deeply inhaled the magical smells. There were faint petrol fumes from the carburetors in the historic slash classical section of the garage and rich, sumptuous leather smells from the European section of the garage. Behind a red velvet rope in the corner, there was a very rare car indeed. A 1971 Lamborghini Diablo with all-wheel drive, wheels, and slaves inside the car to drive for you. Behind that, another pretty cool car, a Ferrari 500 SC, the same kind the famous black football player drives. The 500 SC was a neat car because it was one of Ferrari's fastest. It had 6,000 horsepower at the wheels because it had a train engine, and there were no seats inside, only milk crates to save weight. Billy thought to himself that they should have designed the car with wings because it can really fly. Of course, both cars being Italian, they were really trash, and Billy knew this, but they were such sexy trash. The Italians can be counted on for one thing. Actually, they can be counted on for a couple things, because they can be counted on for at least one good thing, and that is absolutely hitting the nail on the head when it comes to creating vulgar, loud, lewd monstrosities without even a nod or a wink at practicality or common human dignity. Imagine a zoo pen full of monkeys. Now give these monkeys mustaches and fine linen suits and let them play with their boo-boo uh, their, their and make giant boo-boo sculptures, stroking themselves and yanking and touching themselves all over, using their boo-boo to uh, make enormous sculptures of nude female monkeys and male monkey private parts. This is a good metaphor for Italians. Um, he decided that the Italian cars were better for looking at, less good for driving, so best to leave those in the garage today. To the left of them was his favorite car, a sleek all-black racer with big wheels and two big exhaust pipes. This was the McAston Car Bond, a one-off joint venture between Aston Martin and McLaren, commissioned by his dad the General during the English War. Billy's dad was on an important mission to England, and the life of Damien Martin, of Aston Martin fame, was in danger. Billy's dad used his guns to protect Damien, and so Damien said to Billy's dad that he could have any car he wanted in the whole showroom. Billy's dad was a man of refined and elegant tastes, so no commonplace pedestrian car would do. <clears throat> no. Billy's dad wanted Damien Martin to make a special car just for him. The two swore a blood oath, which Billy's dad promised to collect once he had returned from a well-deserved vacation in Cambodia and Thailand. Then, a strange turn of events came to pass. It was at the end of his second week in Cambodia when Billy's dad found himself in an, in an underground snake fighting club sitting next to Jay Leno and Sabian McLaren of McLaren Motorcars fame. <clears throat> they were all having a good time watching King Cobras and Red Spitters duke it out on the dirt floor. <sniffs> they each held in their hand some fancy drink or another. Billy's dad had a champagne flute filled with sweet-smelling schnapps and Pepsi. Jay Leno was drinking a ginger-infused whiskey 
that he had made specially just for him, mixed with Mountain Dew. And Mr. McLaren was driving a car at 242 miles per hour through the snake pit over and over again. They all clapped and hooted and had a good laugh watching the snakes kill each other, striking at each other's necks and sending bits of snake flesh flying into the air. They hooted until their throats were sore, like they'd been sucking on pickled pepper popsicles. <clears throat> All around them, young serving boys were gracefully winding in and out of the crowds, carrying silver platters and refreshing the drinks of anyone who was running low. They were so lithe and sleek, almost like snakes or fast cars themselves. It was hard not to watch them. They had dark, oily skin that shone under the harsh lights of the snake tent, and the rags they wore barely covered them at all. The traditional Cambodian diet was not high in fat, consisting mainly of snake meat, and this you could tell by watching their sinewy muscles flex and strain under their slick skin as they tended to the men in their drinks. Jay Leno eased back in his chair and drank in the scenery with a satisfied smile. Then something bad happened. One of the servers tripped and knocked over a giant porcelain urn filled to the brim with deadly snakes. A scaly avalanche toppled down, covering the dirt floor and sending the room into a panic. Jay Leno was dandling a server boy on his lap gingerly. He threw him off and rose to his feet, shrieking. It was pandemonium. Everybody running and flailing like a giant mosh pit with no exit in sight. It was then that Billy's dad, the general, showed his true bravery and saved the day. He pulled out his standard military issue X1 super assault rifle that he always had on hand for just such emergencies. He quickly marked his target on his HUD and entered bullet time. One by one, with expert marksmanship, the brave general fired on the snakes using highly lethal plutonium rounds. Two shots to the head for each snake, military-style double tap. <clears throat> pop, pop, a snake went down. Pop, pop, and another. Methodically, with speed and precision, more suited to the Marine Corps than the regular army, the general smoked the room full of snakes like a carton of Chesterfields. On the other side of the snake pit, one of the server boys screamed, a deadly king cobra had wrapped itself around his slender leg and was working its way up between his thighs. The boy shaked and vibrated with fear, worried for his life. Jay Leno watched, unable to pull himself away, but likewise unable to help the situation. Billy's dad took aim. His, aim, his arm was steady, and he gripped his assault rifle with a light touch. Squeezed too hard, and there's a chance that micro-vibrations from the body could be transmitted to the gun making it just inaccurate enough to ruin somebody's day. The snake's bulbous head was directly in the general's crosshairs, a very deadly place to be indeed. He fired. With a diabolical hiss, the king cobra's head flew clean off. The rest of the snake's body slumped to the ground at the boy's feet. The last of the snakes had been taken care of. Sabian and McLaren raced over at nearly 200 miles per hour, and draped the boy in a wet burlap drop cloth to comfort him. I can't thank you enough, General, for saving my son, Sabian said. Billy's dad was shocked, though Jay Leno seemed to know what was up with a glimmer in his eye. I, I don't understand, said the General. You see, General, this is my son. He was undercover the whole time. I needed him to pretend to be a server boy, but he was actually my son all along, Sabian laughed to himself. All three men nodded and remarked to themselves how brilliant the trick had been. To think that the son of Sabian McLaren, head of McLaren Motorcars, had been topping off their drinks and entertaining them all night long. By God, it was just too much. After the commotion had died down and the drinks were finished, Mr. McLaren took Billy's dad aside into one of the private suites. He told him there, as part of a blood promise, that he would create a custom car for Billy's dad, no expense spared, whatever he wanted. All he had to do was say the word. 
and so Billy's dad did. A month later, back in England, Billy's dad met with the design teams of both McLaren and Aston Martin at the latter company's Brun Brunswickshire Skunk Works at Proving Ground. There, in an airplane hangar full of top-secret car components, Billy's dad sketched out ideas for the ultimate supercar on a giant blackboard. The car was amazing, with swooping lines to convey speed and angular shapes to convey aggressiveness. It was to have rims as big as pizza plates and a specially designed train engine making over 10,000 horsepower. Wow, what a car. The top designers from Aston and McLaren all shook their heads in disbelief, kicking themselves for not inventing this beast first. But they were only just learning what Billy's dad knew all along. Generals are the best car designers. The next part is where the car gets its name from. Of course, McAston is a polyphonic pseudonym comprised of the root companies Aston Martin and McLaren. Simple uh, language onomics. But the name Carbon comes from the construction of the car made of carbon. It was essential to Billy's dad that his dream car not only be fast and sleek, but also lightweight, so that it could get bigger air on jumps. To this end, the engineers decided that a full carbon fiber construction would be necessary, utilizing methods never before seen in the auto industry. Of course, the wheels, body panels, spoiler, and hood all had to be carbon. But the McAston engineers weren't content doing what every other supercar company did. They had to raise the bar and take things one step further. The entire frame was crafted out of one thread of carbon fiber. Titanium lug nuts were replaced with super lightweight carbon fiber lug nuts. Special tires were crafted for McCaston by Cooper, made entirely out of carbon fiber. The car ran on carbon fiber gasoline, and all the windows were made out of a special transparent carbon fiber composite. Then, in the interest of saving weight, the seats were <laughs> removed and replaced with lightweight carbon fiber milk crates. All the heavy components that weigh a regular road down were regular road car down were removed. The McAston Carbon has no air conditioning, no radio, no lights, no doors, and the transmission only has one gear in it. Of course, it's made of carbon fiber. In fact, the only creature comfort added to the car were two Hitachi Magic Wand vibrators installed in the seats to help the driver and passenger relax on the long races. <clears throat> The McAston Carbon was truly a wonderful car, Billy's favorite by a long shot, but today called for a car that was even more special. Today called for a royal chariot, not some souped-up race machine, and Billy knew just what car he wanted his mom to drive him to the circus in. Uh, at the end of the garage, there was an old wooden door. Through that door, there lay a dimly lit, unassuming hallway full of tattered old racing posters and vintage gas station memorabilia. Down that old disused hall, past the dirty bathrooms that were used by the house servants, past the noisy kitchen where the servants boiled rat meat for themselves, past the furnace room where an army of sweaty black men shoveled coal into roaring fires, there was another wooden door with a pictogram of a horse on it. Looking at this door, you wouldn't make anything of it at all. It was just a dusty old wooden door at the end of a hallway that you probably didn't want to be in. You wouldn't even care to guess what was behind it, but if you did, you would guess something like janitorial supplies or maybe a boiler. Billy approached this door and pulled out a Bluetooth-enabled remote. He pressed a button, and a small wooden panel slid up on the side of the door, revealing a fingerprint ID pad. He put his thumb on the pad, and there was a cacophony of digital blips and bloops. A Macintosh rainbow spinning icon appeared momentarily, indicating that the system was busy. Then, with a burst of pneumatic pressure, the wooden door shot straight up into the ceiling with a doom sound. Beyond the doorway, there was a clean room with black walls and a black floor polished to a mirror finish. In the middle of the room, underneath a single spotlight, 
was a giant rotating platform. And on that platform was a Roush Stage 3 racing Ford Mustang in fire engine red. Hello, Billy, a, sm a soothing female voice said. The voice was heavenly and appeal appeared, appealed to emanate from the very walls themselves. Hello there, Musty, Billy said, striding towards the car. <clears throat> the Stage 3 Roush performance package was no ordinary tune-up job. In fact, the car had been so thoroughly modified that to call it a Ford Mustang was not quite accurate. The wheels were big pizza plates, and it had a 15,000 horsepower train engine. The inside was fully customized with milk crate seats to save weight and a screen in the center console for watching Blu-ray movies and playing games. On that screen currently was a 3D woman's face that was looking at and making eyes at Billy. For a computer, she was quite beautiful. This was Musty, the Roush programmed onboard AI that was designed to be at the driver's beck and call. Musty had been loaded with answers to Billy's OkCupid OK questions, so her personality, in a way, was meant to complement his. You wouldn't guess where we're going today, today, Musty, said Billy. Hmm, now if I only had one guess, I'd guess the circus, Musty replied. How'd you know that? Heh, because your mother already came down to have me scan the QR codes from the tickets. In fact, we'd better hurry if we're going to catch up to her. She already left in the Nissan Skyline GTR Nürburgring Edition, and that's a pretty fast car, but not fast enough. Billy strapped himself down to the milk crate seat and punched in the coordinates for Misty to auto drive. On the screen, the 3D woman winked at Billy. She looked like Orchid from Killer Instinct. She was so fucking hot. Billy thought to himself momentarily that he wished that real-life women could be as hot as video game women. Billy wasn't old enough to know anything about love, but he often thought to himself that if in the future it is okay to marry computers, he would want to marry Musty. Musty was everything Billy wanted in a wife. Fast, sexy, dominant, with a wild side. He knew Musty would never cheat on him and that she'd do everything she could to please Billy. The girls at school were only ever interested in themselves, and when they talked to Billy, he, he just wished they would shut up. They talked about such stupid things, Billy couldn't believe it. Sometimes he imagined if the world were run by girls or populated only by girls, it would just fall apart like some big joke, and he was probably right. Billy often heard his Harvard-educated left-wing Jewish teachers sing and dance about how if women were in charge, there wouldn't be any violence, and there would be a utopia on Earth and peace forever. Because women aren't total vengeful bitches. <clears throat> what Billy didn't dare point out, for fear of getting failing grades across the board instead of just in math, because these left-wing types are cutthroat intellectual bullies, no matter how fair and uh, equanimous, equanimous, well, I don't know how to speak English. They tried so desperately to appear. What he, what he didn't want to point out was that women are in charge. Janet Reno, Janet Yellen, Janet Napolitano, Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, Kathleen Sebelius, Nancy Pelosi. As much as Billy wanted to pin the downfall of Western civilization on that crackpot Marxist nigger Muslim Obama, he had to at least concede that Obama didn't do it on his own. Obama had help from women, who without fail turn into absolute sociopaths when given positions of power. In his book, The Shadow of the Torturer, science fiction writer Gene Wolfe imagines an arcane world where the ruling parties maintain their station and enforce their weird, weird rules through the use of torture. The main character and narrator, Siberian, is a member of the Torturer's Guild. <coughs> And in the beginning of the book, he spends some time reviewing the long and hallowed history of said guild. Women are no longer allowed to be torturers, but they once were, until an edict from the autarch banned them from the practice. The reason? 
Female torturers were found to often go above and beyond the prescribed amount of torture, tormenting their victims more severely than the sentences called for, and sometimes accidentally killing them. Really loved Gene Wolfe's books. He read, uh, he read through them all when he was five years old, and it always struck him as remarkable how this great author illuminated such a subtle but important human truth using a historical side note. Yes, real women were cruel and useless, as, as mankind has known practically since its inception. But Musty was hot and never bothered Billy. Musty revved hard, bouncing off the limiter, then dropped the clutch and peeled out of the garage onto the road. Chapter 8. Billy gets a big helping hand. <clears throat> Outside the circus, it was better than Billy could have imagined. People were milling around and playing sideshow games, buying candied cotton and laughing and hollering. But there were dunking stations, apple bobbing stations, face painting stations, balloon popping stations. Billy looked over and saw his best friend from school, Petter, flying high inside a bouncy castle. The smell and odor of fresh hot peanuts cracked through the air like a high voltage electric current where it co-mingled with the unmistakable aroma of fried dough. The ground was covered with trash, which is an old circus custom. Whenever you're done enjoying your fried dough or giant lollipop or what have you, you're supposed to throw the wrapper on the ground. It was great. Billy walked over to the dunking station where his friend Sarah was laughing atop the dunking platform. She was surrounded by men who were all laughing and gawking ravenous, ravenously. <clears throat> some, of, some of them just relaxed and smoked strong pipes and cigars, but many were throwing rotten fruit, trying to hit the dunk trigger, but also sometimes trying to hit Sarah. She was laughing. <clears throat> she was covered in a fine patina of rotten tomato paste and had taken a few potatoes to the eye, causing it to swell up and turn blue. But so far, none of the men had dunked her successfully. They sure did want to see her get wet, though. Ha-ha, your little friend up there takes pleasure and delight in teasing us men. Ha-ha, a strange man breathed in Billy's face. Heh, she sure does. Billy smiled and hoped the man would go away. His breath smelled strange and sweet. Billy couldn't recognize the smell, but something about it made Billy uncomfortable. The man did not go away. See how she writhes and wriggles on the platform. She is shaking because she doesn't want to get wet. Ha! <laughs> Billy reflexively pinched his nose. Uh-huh. She's got that fire inside, that fire that makes women dance. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, man? I used to have a girl like that. She would wiggle and writhe under my fingers like a bucket of worms. I was lucky. Now I have nothing, but I still like to watch. Hey, man, what's the matter? You don't like girls? Billy was looking for a way out, but all around him, men were packed tight. The area smelled like vinegar and cologne. He was overwhelmed with panic. Yeah, yeah. I imagine you don't like girls. You kind of look like a girl. Say, I think that you should be up there wriggling and writhing. You want to get wet, kid? Billy wasn't listening. He was wiggling and writhing, trying to find some way to escape the pulsing crowd. Hey, gents. I say, gents, we have a new contender here. This boy here wants to be dunked. Some men in the crowd turned their attention from the smooth body on the dunking platform over to Billy. In the distance, a low chant started, murmuring at first, then growing until nothing else could be heard. Wiggle, wriggle, writhe. Wiggle, wriggle, writhe. Wiggle, wriggle, writhe. Wiggle, wriggle, writhe. The men with the cigars puffed faster and faster, kissing and tonguing their cigars compulsively. Strange hands reached out from the crowd and manipulated Billy into contorted positions, shoving him closer to the dunk tank. Sarah was hurried off and covered with a robe, and now the men were palming pieces of rotten fruit 
in the eager anticipation of a new target. Billy could hardly breathe, but somewhere in the fracas he managed to think one coherent thought that today was going to be a bad circus day. The crowd was jamming with a Carib Caribbean African groove. The men were swaying with island rhythm and jumping to the beat of a Congo drum. Billy was put in a tight, revealing tribal garment and painted with red target rings. A man in the front with a face covered in soot, wearing tattered rags, gnashed his teeth at Billy and tugged at the loose fabric of his own pants. Billy was crying and hyperventilating. The men carrying him all treated him roughly. However, one man in particular <clears throat> was rougher than the rest. His name might have been John Ramiro, and this Billy thought because Ramiro was looking Billy in the eyes, saying the name over and over again while spraying tobacco juice. John Ramiro! John Ramiro! Ramiro said as he dug his dirty nails into Billy's tender skin. Ramiro's face lit up like a Christmas tree. Such was his joy at watching Billy squirm. Wiggle, wriggle, ride, the crowd chanted. Ramiro twisted and poked and prodded, each time harder than the last. Billy squirmed and jumped, and Ramiro laughed, pressing his fingers deep under Billy's ribs, trying to touch the insides. Then, another man with black lipstick and white paint on his face like the crow reached over and gave Billy an Indian sunburn that the lad would not soon forget. Waves of searing hot pain emanated from his wrist and racked his body, causing him to jump backwards as if he were a stuntman on wires. But Billy was no stuntman. There were no pillows waiting to break his fall, and the unimaginable pain unimaginable pain causing his face to contort was real. From above, a nightstick came crashing down and gave Billy a good knock, but he was too distracted from the Indian burn to care. He wished he could cut his arm off. He looked down at his wrist. In the, res in the red haze of agony, he saw a shining glimmer. It was blurry at first. Then it took shape. He could just barely make it out, but there it was, Omega. Of course, thank God, by some divine providence, Billy had chosen today to wear his custom Omega Speedmaster watch, the one with OnStar built in. He quickly pressed some buttons and put his thumb on the glass, which was also a fingerprint scanner. It beeped and buzzed. Then a rainbow pinwheel animation was displayed, indicating that, that the watch was processing information. He just prayed that Musty was out there listening. Before the watch could respond, the man with the white face paint reached back over, and Indian sun burned Billy so hard that the watch flew off like a soda bottle cap. This one wasn't so painful for Billy, because he immediately lost consciousness flying backwards faster than someone who touched an electric fence at a dinosaur park. Romero was familiar with fine watches, and while he'd never seen an Omega with OnStar, he figured Billy had been up to no good. Running over to the watch, he looked down to see that the rainbow pinwheel was still spinning. Perfect, John Romero laughed to himself. Then he gave the watch a good stomp. He stomped it once, twice, then a dozen times more to be sure that it was broken and couldn't carry out whatever command Billy had issued. The Omega ticked on. Frustrated, Romero picked it up again, pulling out a pearl-handled Kimber 1911 from his Bobble Bee backpack. He threw the watch up into the air, waved his pistol several times as a master swordsman waves a rapier, and fired a military-style double tap at the airborne timepiece. But there was something that laughing John Romero didn't know. Destroying an Omega wristwatch is literally impossible. The Speedmaster spun like a Beyblade and hit the ground, 
where it continued to spin for a minute, stirring up a mini dust and trash tornado. When it finally came to a stop, the exterior was glowing red, hotter than the metal skin on an SR-71 Blackbird after breaking the sound barrier. The rainbow pinwheel popped off, and in its place a message appeared. Command received. The men were now heaving Billy's limp body into the air and chanting louder than ever. Some foamed at the mouth, some sucked their pipes and cigars so hard that their teeth hurt, but all wanted to see the lad get wet. <clears throat> Off in the distance, a 15,000 horsepower train engine roared. It is guaranteed that none of these savages had ever in their lives seen a Stage 3 Roush racing Mustang, but like vicious wolves, they had some evolutionary respect and a fear of loud noises that caused them now to be on notice. John Romero felt a lump in his throat that slowly sank down to his stomach. The furious sound grew closer. The men stopped heaving Billy into the air, and the lads started to regain consciousness. Some of the cigar and pipe smokers went slack-jawed, dropping their pipes and cigars to the ground. Some puffed on their pipes and cigars even faster than before. Then Musty was upon them. The deafening thunder of the 98mm quad-turbocharged Roush Performance V8 drowned out the screams of the depraved men. Musty pulled hard to the right, then to the left, using a Scandinavian flick to initiate a drift. Musty had been programmed to imitate the greatest racing driver of all time, the drift king Tanner Faust, but since her initial programming, the sentient AI had learned a thing or two of her own, and this drift now being displayed was something that even the drift king couldn't pull off on its best day. Musty came into the corner with over a 90 degree entry angle, well past the point of no return for an ordinary car. But thanks to special carbon fiber tie rods and A-arms, she <clears throat> was able to drift at angles up to 270 degrees without spinning out. In a huge cloud of dirt and trash, Musty drifted through the crowd, hitting men with her fenders and sending them flying and using her exhaust as a flamethrower. Left and right, men were running for the hills, many of them taking hard pulls from their cigars and pipes, and some others tugging at the loose fabric of their pants. John Romero took one last puff from two cigars and a pipe at the same time, before Musty's right rear 22-inch Asante wheel swept his legs out from under him and sent him soaring through the air doing so many misty flips that no X Games judge could possibly have kept count. Billy sat up bewildered. Musty opened a Lamborghini-style scissor door and activated the milk, crates, milk crate seat soothing Hitachi magic wand. Inside, she played some of Billy's favorite rock music. Come on, kid. We got a circus to catch. Chapter 9. Billy goes to the big top. Inside the big tent, Billy breathed a sigh of relief. Despite the horrible nature of what he just endured and how much worse it could have been had the men had their way, he was just happy to finally be inside the circus. He was a good kid like that, always focusing on positive things, able to find the silver lining of any cloud. He whispered into his watch, Hey, Musty, thanks again, babe. You really saved the day. Musty said nothing, but instead revved happily and honked her horn, and Billy signed out of the chat, turning to watch the circus. And what a circus it was. It was everything Billy had imagined it to be. No! In fact, it was better. There were ribbon dancers, fire breathers, and elephants galore, being whipped left and right. There were break dancers whose elegant black bodies were moving with the flow of African Caribbean rhythms, and men with whips whipping the dancers to keep them dancing smooth. 
The air was fragrant with fresh, hot peanuts and freshly cooked hot dogs covered in ketchup, mustard, relish, and all the fixings. Billy smiled with a warm smile of true contentment. He had never been happier in his whole life. Even those pesky clowns didn't seem so bad today. They were going around in their tiny cars, honking their noses, spraying fresh seltzer water at each other. But Billy just couldn't be bothered by them. <clears throat> Everything was perfect, and the clowns, heck, he didn't mind them. The announcer took center stage in the middle ring. He was a kind-looking man, finely dressed in a long-tailed coat like an orchestra conductor, in one hand holding a metal-tipped whip, and in the other an old-timey acoustic megaphone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Grand Circus! There was loud applause. <clears throat> We have an amazing show for you today. A curious cavalcade of characters. A magnificent medley of mayhem. A preposterous presentation of horror tricks. Most of the audience members were bouncing up and down in their seats, unable to contain their excitement. And it has become known to me today that we have a very special boy in our presence. Yes, ladies and lads, we have a young boy here today who's wanted to come to the circus more than anything in his whole life. A steampunk orchestra marched out with big drums and tubas and whistles and gear goggles and uh, rifles with golden scopes, steampunk rifles with tubes going to air pressure tanks on the back. And there were flying whirly gig copters and all sorts of steampunk, steampunk gentlemen in pit helmets and top hats and Victorian dress ascots to be seen everywhere. And that was his uh, royal ship, Prince Peterson, with a monocle and a magic, he's using magic with one hand and casting spells with it, and then in the other hand he had a steampunk gun, a Gatling gun, a Gatling pistol, and he was shooting all sorts of zombies, and Victorian English zombies, and uh, he had on pointy he had on uh, wingtip shoes and their jet boots, uh, the Victorian steam jet boots. <clears throat> <clears throat> Billy was startled by the announcer's announcement. From out of nowhere, two giant spotlights swung over and beamed on him. He instantly turned completely red like a lobster. Please, ladies and lads, a big round of applause, big round of applause, big, big round of applause for Billy! The crowd roared. Confetti and streamers rained down and clowns sprayed geysers of seltzer high into the air. It was an extravagant sight, one would expect to find in Las Vegas, not in some small-town circus. Billy was overjoyed. He laughed and clapped and tugged at the stockings of his mother and the loose fabric of his own pants, his mother sitting next to him eating fresh hot peanuts one by one. Then the audience died down for the announcer to get on with the show. With a flourish of the wrist, he produced from thin air a magic wand. He cleared his throat and took a moment to appreciate the delicious silence of a rapt audience. While he had done this trick a thousand times, it never got old. It was pure theater, and he was a master player. With a grandiose wave and a ballerina spin, the announcer pointed his Did I just delete it? How do you undo it? Come on, man. Oh, fuck, man. The announcer pointed his wand at the elephant and fired a magic bolt. 
<clears throat> With a zip-zap crash, the bolt sparks, sparkled through the air and struck the elephant squarely on the trunk. There was a giant explosion of pink fire, blue sparks, yellow smoke. The elephant immediately dropped dead to the floor. The crowd roared. The applause was so loud it was deafening. Billy jumped and hooted. The man next to him stomped his feet and slapped his thighs. A lady two rows down threw her peanuts into the air, and others tried to catch the falling peanuts in their mouths. The announcer cleared his throat into the megaphone. Ahem, I do say ahem. Please, ladies and lads, calm down. There's more. The elephant rumbled a bit, then started to smoke. The announcer swung his wand in a windmill wind-up, like an old-time cartoon boxer preparing to swing. He said some magic words, did a front flip, clacked his heels together, and fired another bolt this time at the audience. It crackled through the air and struck one man in the bridge of the nose. Then it zoomed all the way across the tent to strike another man square in the temple. Then the bolt of magic energy broke off into two bolts, both careening around the tent, striking people indiscriminately. The twin bolts scorched the air on their path around the three rings, and finally they came back together, intertwining like two snakes in passion and crashing into the dead elephant. There was an enormous eruption of confetti and streamers, and multicolored smoke filled the room until it was nearly impossible to see anything. Suddenly, the air became very cold and then very hot, and all 200 audience members felt the sensation of two dozen child fingers tickling and poking at their backsides. This sure was some trick. Finally, the smoke cleared. The elephant was gone, and in its place stood an incredible sight. Dressed up in lacy black lingerie, complete with stockings and garter belt, and made up with lipstick and face paint, as if to appear beautiful, it was the world-famous Fat Woman. Not a single fanny in the house remained sitting. All at once, the audience rose to their feet and clapped wildly, such was the glee at seeing this perverse oddity. A man behind Billy choked on his cigar and ex exhaled a puff of smoke so big that it completely enveloped Billy. Billy clapped and clapped, churning the air around him such that the smoke became a mini tornado and spun away. The fat woman was glorious. No one had seen such a sight before. She must have been close to 300 pounds and her girth was such that her lingerie had to be specially made by master craftsmen. The circus folk had taken great pains to doll her up, making her as beautiful as such a hideous creature could be, and all the townspeople found this profoundly amusing. Here before them was a, a monstrous woman dressed in sexy lingerie with an elaborate hairdo and made up as if she were a beauty pageant queen. Everybody laughed. <clears throat> An old-timey microphone descended from the rafters, and the incredible fat woman launched into some sort of stand-up comedy routine. Look at me! I'm just as sexy and elegant as a normal-sized woman, she said with a knowing smirk to uproarious laughter. I think I'll model my new lingerie and take some pictures of myself, because so many men would love to see me in suggestive poses. Again, there were hearty laughs to be had throughout. The fat woman posed and made kissy faces, and a gorgeous, slender young woman dressed identically was brought out for comparison. The fat woman made ugly faces at the slender one, feigning disgust, as though her slender young body were less appealing than her own heaving mass. Then a series of shirtless, muscle-bound men came running out. They fawned over and knelt before the incredible fat woman, pretending to be somehow attracted to the unlovable beast, and they utterly ignored the thin woman, who, to any sane person's eyes, appeared to be a goddess in comparison with the fat. Finally, as funny as her pantomime had been, everybody grew tired of seeing the fat woman. In fact, many in the audience had eye aches and were rubbing their eyes frantically. She was ushered away to her feeding trough, and the stage was cleared for the announcer again.
Chapter 10, The Clown. The time had come for the final act. <clears throat> Strobe lights fired left and right, in many cases inches away from the audience members' faces, blinding them. In the center ring, the announcer was showboating around, doing a chicken dance, sprinting back and forth on his tiptoes, waving his hands like the maitre d' of a fancy restaurant, and pretending like he was in a prison break and the spotlight was a guard tower light. The audience applauded enthusiastically, and he soaked it up, alternately making sarcastic who-me faces and pretending like the audience applause was, a, was machine gun fire and he was being riddled with bullets. He then whipped off his coat, bow tie, cummerbund, and shirt with one motion, revealing another set underneath. Then he bent over the elephant's drinking trough and took many gulps of dirty brown water. After he had his fill, he turned to the crowd and made a face and a hand signal as if to say, Oh, yeah! <clears throat> After several minutes of this showing off and grandstanding, the lights came to a rest, and he motioned for the crowd to settle down. Billy was so excited, he nearly bit both lips off. The cigar man behind him was making frantic noises, and he mule-kicked Billy several times in the back of the head. Such was his excitement. The announcer took out a starter pistol and fired it into the air, demanding the complete attention of everyone. The whole tent fell silent. Well, ladies and lads, our, our show is nearly over, and it's about time to go home. But we wanted to make sure you get all your money's worth, and you get to go home with smiling faces. <clears throat> and to be perfectly honest, we wanted to make sure that you got to see the best goddamn circus that you've ever seen in your meager little lives. The announcer smirked fiercely. He paused, and he paused for an unnecessary amount of time, relishing in the fact that he had just made the entire tent full of people his bitch. That's right. Suck it, little bitches, he thought to himself and said aloud inadvertently. That's why we saved the best for last. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the clown. With a puff of smoke, the announcer was lifted off on wires, flying to some unknown place behind the stands. The strobe lights fired again, even brighter than before and so much confetti rained down that one could barely see five feet in front of himself. Air raid sirens blared, deafening anyone who didn't cover their ears, and Hitachi magic wands were activated in all the seats. Giant air conditioners all throughout the tent were turned on simultaneously, as well as space heaters. The heat was searing, searing and the cold was bone-chilling. In the center ring, an iris opened up, and from it rose a metal platform on which stood the clown. He was dressed in full clown regalia, with giant red shoes, baggy harlequin pants with a big target emblazoned on the crotch, a fine striped vest, and a shirt with big blousy sleeves, epaulets, and a multicolored pinwheel hat. Oh, and of course a giant red nose. He was standing with his arms crossed and his legs wide, waiting for the platform to come to a stop. As soon as it did, the confetti stopped pouring. The air conditioners and heaters and strobe lights shut off, and the whole tent was held in icy silence, utterly captivated. Then, clown music blared. <laughs> The clown sprung into action, wielding seltzer bottles in both hands as he charged at the crowd. When he reached the front row, he stopped and sprayed both bottles high into the air, showering everyone with a cool, refreshing mist. The music changed to a more upbeat, synthesized clown music, and the clown wiggled his hips. People could just not believe what they were seeing. He did back handsprings, about 50 of them total, until he was at the opposite end of the tent. 
The audience screamed as they jived with this cool clown. He took out a cigar, a big one, put it in one lucky man's mouth, and gave him a light. <clears throat> Moments later, the cigar exploded, and the clown cartwheeled his way back to the middle of the ring. The fat and thin women from earlier quickly wheeled out a big trampoline. The clown gave them both silly kisses and sent them on, a way, on their way with a spray from the seltzer bottle. He then mounted the trampoline and gave a big bow before starting to jump. The crowd hooted as he jumped higher and higher. Each time they thought he had gone the highest he could go, the clown proved them wrong by going higher. Billy started, Billy started to feel dizzy from following the clown with his eyes as he soared up and down, up and down, flipping and twirling the whole way. The clown then jumped so high that he actually reached the rafters above, which he grabbed a hold of and pulled himself up. Like a cat or some sort of night burglar, the clown, the clown pranced dangerously along the rafters, tossing water balloons down on the crowd. The water balloons were actually filled with shaving cream, and they coated everyone with frothy white foam upon bursting. Of course, everybody was delighted with this, and they begged and begged and called out to the clown, hoping to be his next target. Down came a balloon right atop Billy's big head. His hair must have been very soft, because this one didn't burst on landing, and so to help things along, the cigar man behind him gave him a swift kick. The kick missed the balloon, only striking Billy on the crown, and the balloon went tumbling over down two rows and tucking itself neatly down the shirt front of a woman in, it, in an elegant white gown. The man next to her had no problem gingerly removing the thing, which he then hurled back into the center ring, where it landed with a loud splat. The clown swung down on wires like an eagle, snatching up one audience member's hot dog, then flew back up. He came down for a second dive, took a healthy sip from someone's soda cup, and again shot back into the air. <clears throat> Those in the crowd who'd seen the clown before knew that this was the prelude to the best part of the show, and they relished it accordingly. Those who were newcomers had no idea what was to follow, but the ominous feeling in the air was undeniable, and many chose to sit on their hands for fear of biting their nails too quick. On a rafter, the clown took a grandiose bow, and then proceeded to tap dance a little bit, which, of course, everyone thought was very clever. A flap opened on the side of the tent, and a gang and the gang of shirtless, well-oiled, well-muscled men wheeled in an ornate pie cart stacked to the very top with fresh cream pies. The clown was hoisted down to the center ring very slowly so as to heighten the excitement and pleasure. On either side of the giant circus tent, big fat women struck at even bigger taiko drums and danced so that their bellies jiggled with the rhythm. Left and right, people had to smack themselves out of disbelief. This was truly a show like none other in the world. The clown picked up two pies, one in each hand. He skipped and leaped, and the ropes hoisted him away with a vicious jerk. He flew toward the stands with amazing speed and decked two unsuspecting people clean in the face with the pies. The victims had the good sense not to cover their faces. To cover one's face before a pie attack was a sign of grave disrespect, not only towards the clown, but also towards the whole circus, and any sort of face covering or flinching would result in the whole circus being shut down and everybody's night being ruined. It was important to take the pie head on and be brave. Billy's father told him of a tale once, where he was young enough to love the, uh, when he was young enough to love the circus and the circus games. The brave general himself, although he didn't talk about it uh, much, was also an avid circus goer. And once upon a time, he had indeed been pied in the face by the illustrious clown. <clears throat> of course. Being a general in the army, Billy's father was more than ready for the pie and faced it without cowardice. 
But in that story, there lay a warning for young Billy. Because after the general had taken the pie, the clown went, then went on to the next victim, pie in hand. This time around, the pie was destined for a coal miner with charred skin and fraying boots, a man that looked rougher and tougher than most. However, when it came time to take his pie, he flinched, jerking out of his seat and avoiding the pie at the last minute. Well, Billy's father had always said the rest of the story was too tragic to tell Billy, but rest assured, everyone's circus day was ruined, and that old coal miner was laughed out of town. Billy thought now of the old coal miner and what could possibly have happened to him. To think of it, committing such a mistake in, in such a public arena, it chilled him to the core. The thought was so hypnotizing that Billy did not notice the clown flying at him presently, pie arm cocked. Chapter 11. The Last Days of Big Billy. <clears throat> The next few moments would seal Billy's fate forever. This he knew immediately upon seeing the clown with his evil grin. The lad dug his, dug his heels deep into the dusty, trash-covered floor and clenched his fingers tight around the rim of his seat. Would he be a good boy and not flinch? Or would he mess this up like everything else in his life? Sure. He wasn't built to excel at maths or become some sort of great opera conductor, but the circus was everything to him. The circus was life, and he had studied for this moment since he was old enough to listen to the general and his wise tales. He closed his eyes and braced for the gooey impact, thinking of his mother and of Musty and all the school children who looked up to him and wanted to see him succeed, succeed. But the gooey impact didn't come. He opened his eye a crack. There was the pie, mere inches from his face. He could see the detail, the soft mounds of whipped cream, the ridges of the yummy pie crust, the shiny foil of the pan, the hard rock in the middle surrounded by razor blades and nails. It was all there. And yet why wasn't it in his face? He looked around, and the whole arena was looking dead at him open mouth. There was the clown, equally shocked, and as Billy looked more, the face of the clown turned from shock to disgust and then to anger. He must have flinched! He didn't take his pie! One man sputtered through cigar-clenched teeth. Billy's stomach dropped. Some men are lucky enough to die quickly, without ever knowing the meaning of real death. Billy now experienced the opposite. Death was upon him and all around him, but without the relief that actual death affords its victims. The color drained from his skin, and he couldn't feel his hands. The sickest part is, somewhere deep down, he knew he deserved this. He didn't remember flinching, but of course he did flinch. Of course he had screwed this up like everything else. That big, ugly head of his must have been full of chicken nuggets because it sure wasn't full of any brains. Oh, how Billy wished he could just dash his head against the, that rock in the pie. He wished someone would come and kick him in the head with steel-toed boots. If only fate would be merciful enough now to send some good Samaritan to put him to sleep. <clears throat> Mess him up, an old lady yelled. He didn't take his pie. Cut him in two, another voice cried. Voices continued to ring out until the whole place was calling for Billy's blood. Billy punched coordinates into his Omega watch, but the tent must have had some sort of communication jamming technology because the watch just blipped and blooped and went dead. He could barely stand up straight. He was breathing too fast. The cigar man behind him reached over and stripped all his clothes off in one motion. The crowd cheered cruelly. The clown was laughing his head off. What could be so funny in such a grave and horrible situation? The people in the crowd jeered and threw rotten vegetables, aiming for Billy's eyes and then his crotch. The man behind him mule kicked at Billy's head and neck as if he were trying to start a troublesome dirt bike. All around, people spewed hate 
and yet all the clown could do is laugh and laugh. Billy's field of vision closed down, and his ears went deaf to the crowd's noise. In the middle of the soupy blackness, there was a pinprick of light, in the center of which stood the clown. The clown grew larger and larger still, until snarled old clown teeth were all that Billy could see and smell, and the hot clown breath stinking was all that Billy could hear. The clown reached in close, and in a hateful hiss, he whispered to Billy the truth. You didn't flinch, Billy. I just don't like you. Fuck. You. Since the clown had rushed at him, tricked him, and taken from him everything that mattered, it had only been 60 seconds, but it felt like six hours. Billy was now living through a slow-motion nightmare, custom-tailored only for him, and nobody, not his mother, not Musty, not his best friend Petter, not Mr. Mythtetcher could help him. And here, my dear viewers, here is where we would end our tale. Where we would end our tale. The hapless hero was given every gift in the world from God, and in the end, like in all the tragedies of ancient Greece, his hubris, his sense of invincibility, proved his undoing. Yes, this is where we would end if this were a mere story. But this is not a story. This is reality. And in reality, the tragedy doesn't end quite so quickly and painlessly. No. In reality, the characters are given a lifetime to chew themselves to pieces, to torture themselves with the memory of their folly. I sold my car and took out a large loan with 20% APR, using my own beloved mother as co-signer, all to purchase bitcoins near their 2013 peak of $1,200, only to lose my nerve after the Chinese crash and sell everything at $500. It's a real story. I also got STDs cheating on my girlfriend and gave them to her. But this story is about Billy and the consequences of his actions. Chapter 12. Big good morning for Billy. A deadly chill crept through the blast doors and nipped at Billy's toes, causing him to stir. It was always like that in his dwell pod, as he lived in the poorest district of the hub, and these pods were kept in particularly poor states of repair. With a defeated groan, he arose and looked out the fist-sized viewport at a bleary landscape. Hello there, Bilbo, a digital voice wheezed. Hello, hello, Bartholomew, said a drained Billy. Bartholomew was Billy's digital concierge, or Digicon. He was the cheapest and lowest quality concierge with barely any rambus and no apps but it was nearly impossible to get by without a Digicon, and at least Billy had one. In the news today, mister, here's the headlines. Bomb goes off, kills people. Big guns, drugs, war. New singer, big breasts. Enough, cried Billy, giving Bartholomew a good thwap about the noggin with a rolled up towel. I've had enough of you, you fucking piece of shit. Another thwack with the towel sent Bartholomew spinning across the room, sputtering nonsense and spraying sparks everywhere. Ah, oh, man. Now I've really done it. Why didn't that blasted clown just put me out of my misery? Every day is hell. Every day is hell. Oh, God. How I just want to die. Please. Please, God, if you have any mercy, kill me. Kill me, God. Billy fell to his knees. The floor had a shallow pool of water. The thermoseals must have been leaking again. It was apparent that God was not going to kill him, but he'd still make sure Billy had a bad day. He could hear the clown whispering to him from the past. Fuck you, Billy. Fuck 
you really issued a voice command or voice comm. Fridge, open. The slick metal door to Billy's fridge did so. Inside, a paltry amount of food and nothing healthy at all, just junk. Billy reached for a big tub of Briar's Neapolitan ice cream. He opened it up and all the chocolate was gone. The chocolate ice cream was the only one that Billy liked. But Neapolitan is all they sold at the dehydrated ice cream automat. So it was either an ice cream flavor he didn't like or go without ice cream entirely. Billy wept quietly at the sight. An outsider, might, an outsider might have heard Billy's dilemma and his blubbering and thought him a spoiled brat. But what people who have it easy don't understand is that when the entire weight of the world is on your back, one more little straw can bring the whole house of cards crashing down. Billy went ahead and dug into the vanilla. It was miserable, but he needed the sugar to sustain himself or he would surely die. He hated himself every moment. The general wouldn't have blubbered like this. Mother wouldn't have blubbered like this. Even Petter, who was a coward, more cowardly than Billy, wouldn't have blubbered like this. <clears throat> the sweet cream was too good for Billy. He deserved to eat boo-boo. <coughs> he wished he could kick himself in the crotch and in the head, but he couldn't reach. So instead, he pinched himself all about the forearms and on the inside of his thighs. It hurt, but not enough. So he issued a voice comm for the kitchen drawer to open, and from it pulled a sharp-looking fork. He used it to poke himself in the tummy until he was through. Then he knew the, the time for self-pity was over. Uh, God, fucking damn it, man. I need to go to the hospital tonight. <clears throat> he could probably make himself cry a bit more, but it wouldn't be as satisfying. He dragged himself to his wardrobe, put on his single rubber suit, and shuffled out the door. Chapter 13. Billy's Big Bad Day. <clears throat> Work that day was especially tedious. Once again, he was chosen for toilet shift at the sewer plant, which was the worst possible job for any worker at the whole hub. He knew the other men were cheating him, hacking into the mainframe and altering the reports so that he'd be selected for toilet shift more often than not. But he didn't care. He knew that out of all of them, he was best suited for toilet shift, because out of all of them, he was the only one with no pride. Like so many victims, he let his aggressors bully him, because it felt right, because it was right. Like so many victims, he deserved to be a victim. As he descended down into the toilet tanks, his radio buzzed, and out squawked the voice of young Petter, now all grown up. Billy, we need these uh, tanks to be real clean. They're coming down to do an inspection later. Fuck you, Billy stammered. What was that last part? They're coming down to do an inspection later. Thank you, Billy. Of course, Petter didn't say F you to Billy. He was always so kind, and he didn't need to be either. Petter got good grades all throughout school and made all the right moves afterwards. He'd taken a sizable inheritance and invested it in foreign companies, making himself a fortune fit for a king. He was a Goldie, and as such, he was fit for any job in the hub, choosing for himself a cushy role as commander at the sewer plant. Petter had really made it. <clears throat> he had a dream job, and he was able to eat rich and exotic foods, and often Billy looked up and wondered what it would be like if things had gone differently. He landed with a giant splash of icky goo. It was all darkness for a moment, but somehow... Billy managed to fight his way to the surface. He knew the lad wasn't done yet. He still had some, had some in him, just like his old man, the general. Beneath him, 200,000 tons of molten sewage rumbled and churned in a way that it usually doesn't. Something had gone horribly wrong. His radio cracked and buzzed. Billy, did you break something down there? God damn, man, you stupid asswipe. Ever since we were kids, you were a liability. I always knew it. I always knew you'd fuck me. I'm going to lose my job thanks to you. You and that big empty head. 
Billy treads sewage for dear life, choking on the stuff and reaching for support but finding none. Some kind of strange hot brown sludge, Billy didn't know what it was, invaded his lungs and eyes and mouth and ears. Billy had no idea what the stuff was, but it sure had a smell to it. It smelled familiar, almost like booby or doodum. It was churning and flowing around him, the strong undulations tugging at his legs, tugging at his legs and trying to pull him under. He fought and fought for dear life, but with every thrust of his arms and every kick of his legs, he seemed to just sink deeper and deeper into the stinky no-no. He reached out and his fingers found something, his chest filled with hope and then despair as he realized he'd struggled his way to the very bottom of the tank. The clown was down there with him, as always, whispering and laughing. Fuck you, Billy! Ha ha ha! Fuck you! He finally managed to get the handle of his grappling gun, or grap gun, just as it seemed the sewage was going to consume him. He fired it straight up towards the control tower. The magnetic claw torpedoed through the brown nana like a harpoon, breaking the surface with a great big blast of shit, soared through the air, grabbed the metal bottom of the control tower, and the cable instantly became taut. Petter barked some profanities through the radio, but Billy didn't care. A moment later, he rocketed upwards, out of the toilet tank to safety. Chapter 14 Billy gives Petter a big surprise. You poor son of a bitch, man. The boss is really going to shit when he sees what you did, one of the nearby workers said, half to Billy and half to himself. Thanks, but keep your black opinion to yourself, Billy said. Billy looked down. The toilet tank was undulating like a jacuzzi and frothing with steam. He must have broken something really expensive. Red, al red alarm lights were flashing everywhere, and all around the sewer plant, men in rubber suits were running around frantically. A digital voice blared over the intercom. Attention, sewer plant workers. Continue working. Everything is good. Do not leave your post. Keep working. Attention, Goldies. Leave your posts and evacuate the plant immediately. Repeat. All Goldies evacuate the plant immediately. <clears throat> the door to the command tower opened, and out stepped a furious petter. He was red in the face, his tie was loose, and his clothes were awry. He locked eyes with Billy and stormed, stormed down the golden spiral staircase. I, Billy stammered, don't you say one word, you stupid motherfucker, you ugly fuck. I never had a rich general daddy like you did. I worked for everything I ever got. You had everything and you threw it away. I had nothing. I became a goldie. You are stupid as fuck, man. You probably don't even understand what I'm saying to you right now. Petter jabbed at Billy's temple with two straight fingers. Is this registering with you, dude? Do you realize what you've done with your clumsy hands? This whole plant is minutes away from exploding thanks to you. God, fuck you, stupid fuck. Petter was going to spit right in Billy's face, but ultimately decided it wasn't worth it. He was right about Billy understanding not one word of his tirade, and to spit would have just been wasted energy. Petter kicked off both his shoes and dashed for the toilet tank, vaulting over the handrail and plunging into the murky depths below. A moment later, the sirens and alarms went off, and so did the giant vents that had been spraying aerosolized boo-boo everywhere. The digital voice from before boomed. Attention, all sewer plant workers and all Goldies, return to your stations. Repeat, all sewer plant workers and Goldies, return to your stations. Sewer plant status, green, code G97A1. The workers came to their senses. Billy was able to catch his breath. He looked around. It appears as though the damage he'd done was minimal, but in the fray, he'd lost his best friends since childhood. He was dumbfounded, filled with crisscrossing feelings of relief and sadness. He knew today was going to be bad, but he hadn't known quite how bad bad could get. 
Billy took one last look down the toilet tank at his bosom buddy's final resting place. He shrugged. Oh well, just one more kick in the nuts, I guess. Chapter 15, Billy's Not-So-Big Yucky Meal. <clears throat> Billy made a stop at the hokum dog stand on the way home. Hokum dogs were like hot dogs, but they weren't quite hot and therefore could not legally be said to be so. The price of heat and energy had, rid had risen so high that the antiquated notion of wasting it on food was absurd. Billy, like all other hub inhabitants, even the richest of the rich, had grown used to eating food that was nearly frozen. His hokum dog was served on a cold, wet bun. The strip of meat-like synth meal in the middle slithered and wiggled as if it were alive. There was an app called What a Hokum available in the App Store that interfaced with one's neural synapses, causing the user to feel as though he were experiencing an expensive meal at a five-star restaurant. It was very popular amongst gum-dums who couldn't afford the ten and fifteen-star restaurant apps, but Billy hadn't upgraded the firmware and a Hewlett-Packard app weasel, and so had to go raw. It was a disgusting meal, but he needed to eat something, and this was as good as it was going to get. He continued down back alleys and side streets until he made it to the main throughway, where gyroscopic unicycle personal transports could be rented from a kiosk for a small fee. The kiosk screens flickered to life. City Speeder Easy Trans, please indicate your citizen class and scan your dub ident. There were three tiers of City Speeders offered. For Goldies, the kiosk offered G600 Platinum models, which included Hitachi Magic Wand vibrators and a free cheesy pizza. For Glubnubs, who were the blue-collar working schmoes of the hub, the kiosk had Sony Intimidators and Daihatsu Tekken Pros, both of which were competent transporters that offered high degrees of luxury and style for the money. But Billy wasn't a Goldie or a Glubnub. He was a gum dum, the lowest of the low the social waste of the hub. He could barely afford an obsolete Digicon, and he had to start he had to eat sickening hokum dogs every day. And the city speeder that he had access to was the worst of the worst, a 3M eye mover. <clears throat> with a heavy sigh, Billy mounted his rusty old eye mover and got on with the business of getting himself home. People in the fast traffic lane zipped past. Instead of horns, the first and second tier city speeders were equipped with electro-shocking devices. So you could just point your device at another city speeder, press the button where the horn usually was, and give the person in your targeting reticle a good zap. As Billy puttered along, he was subjected to a barrage of electro bolts from malicious drivers for no reason other than to punish him for driving such a turd. The 3M iMover had a top speed of 400 miles per hour, which meant that he had to endure this torture twice as long as if he were driving any other uh, speeder. It was a brutal kick between the legs to have to deal with this at the end of a long day, and it wasn't made any more comfortable or convenient by the fact that most iMovers reeked of gasoline fumes and had barely any protection from the elements. It took Billy about 50 minutes. But finally, he saw signs for Culture Center B67A, his home unit. He punched a few commands into the iMover's GUI, graphical user interface, and the speeder slowed down, turning towards the exit. A deafening mechanical hum then filled the cockpit. Billy didn't know why, but these particular speeders always seemed to do that on the last leg of his journey. By now, He'd grown so used to it and actually quite enjoyed the comforting roar of gears and drive shafts clanking and grinding. It reminded him that he was a worthless nothing and that he deserved hell and he appreciated the honesty. A rush of cold air hit Billy as the doors to his dwell pod fired open. There was no safety mechanism on the doors, so they opened with the speed and strength of industrial equipment and Billy had to stand clear. Inside, Regulations meant that Billy had to keep everything below a certain certain temperature to combat Glow Climcha, global climate change, 
And furthermore, he had to pay for this air conditioning out of his own wages. It struck him as absurd and unfair, being forced to keep his own abode at such unbearably low temperatures, and to pay for it too. But ultimately, Billy decided that the masters, who were the final rank above Goldie's, knew what was best, and that he, as stupid as he was, shouldn't go questioning anyone's decisions. Inside, Bartholomew was still sputtering and sparking on the wet floor. He would have to fix him soon. But first, some refreshments. Billy hurried over to the one table in the pod and laid down a crumpled up paper hokum dog wrapper. He unfolded the waxy paper, smoothed it over, and sat down with a greedy look on his face. Usually, he liked to have a cold shower and put on some less dirty clothes before the one enjoyable part of his day. But today was so bad, Billy couldn't wait for his relaxation. In the center of the paper was a thin film of black tar, which Billy started scraping together into a dirty little ball, just slightly smaller than a pea. It was industrial soot, an amalgam of chemical byproducts typically found lining the sides of the giant smokestacks, which were so ubiquitous. The soot was the savior of all gum gums. Billy was no exception. Daily, his contact who worked at the smoke factory would set aside these chems for Billy, typically tucking them away in Billy's locker at the sewer plant, but sometimes delivering the goods through some more exotic means. Money was never involved. Initially, Billy thought maybe his smoke factory connection did the deed out of pity, but as time went on and the drug went from being a pleasurable escape to just another set of chains, Billy thought maybe his guardian angel was actually a Goldie who liked to get stupid gum dums hooked as a joke. Now, Billy didn't care anymore. As long as he had the soot, he was happy not knowing anything. He tucked the ball neatly up his left nostril and collapsed face first onto the wet floor. Chapter 16, Billy's Great Big Realization. Billy woke up 48 hours later. Had the weekend really gone by so quickly? He viewed this fast passage of time as a good thing. For most people, Billy included real life and any sort of experience that life could contain, even ones enhanced by hallucinogens or other more traditional drugs, uh, were so miserable and undesirable that the most popular drug of the day, the soot, was popular precisely because it made people slip into a black hole and not have to deal with anything. The danger with heroin or weed or something like that is that while those drugs may trick you into thinking you don't have a care in the world, oftentimes subconsciously you did, and that would ruin your high. The only way to be 100% sure that no reality bummers would harshen your mellow is by putting yourself into a coma. Not a dreamlike state, but a full medical coma. <clears throat> when soot users woke up, there were more technological inventions. Their bank accounts had earned interest. And whatever problems that were bothering them were usually solved. Billy's only regret was that he couldn't afford enough soot to knock himself out for a hundred years. Bartholomew? Billy had started to ask for the time when he realized that he had brained his Digicon in a fit of unhappiness. It was probably best to fix the thing before a minor inconvenience turned into a serious problem. And so Billy got out his toolkit. Toolkit open, he commanded. Billy stood back, giving the toolkit plenty of room to open. A drawer at precisely nut level shot out like a pneumatic battering ram giving all its contents a harsh jangle. Inside the high-tech weatherproof container was an eyeglass, screwdriver, some nylon thread, and dull tin snips. Billy removed them all and set upon his wounded robotic companion. Circus, <laughs> Bartholomew belched. Billy's hands froze in their position. Circus. Bartholomew had just said circus. He racked his brain trying to think. Finally, he concluded what one would naturally conclude in such a situation. In fact, it was quite easy to see Billy was becoming insane and starting to hallucinate. Realizing this, 
Billy smiled a smile of relief and got back to work. For a moment there, he thought maybe something had gone wrong, but no, it was just his most horrifying failures from two years ago coming back to haunt him in the present day, probably for the rest of his life. Billy soldiered on, mending his dear artificial fellow with the tin snips. <laughs> spark, spark, circus, today, circus. <laughs> that time it was undeniable. Bartholomew had said a circus. Frantically, Billy finished the repairs. He was no repairman, that's to be sure. But thankfully, the Kyocera My Bartholomew that was such a popular Digicon with gum dumbs was pretty bulletproof mainly due to the fact that it had to be simple enough for an idiot to operate. An idiot like Billy. A few screws tightened, a few wires rerouted, and soon Bartholomew was back in working order, albeit a little worse for wear. In the nude today, mister, here's the headlines. Bomb goes off, tails people, big gun. Billy stopped him short. No, no, you numbskull, that's news from Friday. Drugs war, new single big breast, cyber circus in town day only, hub citizens happy free health care. Billy shot up like a young boy's willy. Stop! That last article. Tell me what that was. Well, master, it says here that everybody be real happy with their free health care, and it be working real well, Bartholomew said, happy to be of service. No, no, blast you, you computerized blockhead. The story before that, tell me that one, about the circus. Cyber Circus, greatest in the world, featuring the amazing clown. Bartholomew was stopped short by a perfectly executed roundhouse kick which sent his head ricocheting around the room. A normal man, having just exercised such wild aggression, might take a moment to soak in the aftermath of his handiwork and how badass it was, maybe a little bit in shock at his own brass. But Billy had been molded by a lifetime of pain, and the gulf that stood between Billy and a normal man was light years across. It seemed Billy had lived a thousand lifetimes consecutively, that his torture was so deep and profound that it spanned eons. All throughout those eons, Billy's nemesis was a figment, some clown that may once have been real, but was always more of a myth than a man. In the years that followed his undoing, Billy added to the mystique of this myth, treating the clown in his own mind with fear and hatred, yes, but always with the reverence of a deity. It was hard to explain and impossible even for Billy to make sense of with his own limited mental resources, but something about Bartholomew's news report and the immediacy of this moment opened for Billy a window in his mind through which the clown was a man and not a myth. The window was closing fast. Maybe it had already closed, and no matter what, Billy would always be left with dust, a ruined life, nothing. But there was the open window with a man standing past it, and Billy knew that men bleed and men die. Back during the transition, wealth confiscation, and Rita's fair, fair redistribution. When all private wealth was seized and redistributed fairly, making the world better, Billy's family had done the right and only sensible thing and handed over the keys to their personal fortune to GovCom, along with anybody else who wanted to stay out of prison jail. But Billy hadn't been quite such a good boy. Like many little boys, he had that one special treasure that he wanted to keep, and so he did risking his own life to do so. He knew he was a puddle of puke, he knew he deserved nothing, but something in his heart told him to hide that treasure until the moment was right. Billy hid the treasure so well, in fact, that he had forgotten about its existence until just now. It was now that Billy issued a voice comm that he thought he'd never issue. Drawer X11, open. With a burst of pneumatic pressure, a narrow and shallow drawer shot out on a robotic boxing arm and clipped Billy right between the legs. The pain staggered him, but there was no time for belly aching and blubbering now. He was the general. He reached into the drawer and deftly pulled out the gleaming Omega Speedmaster that he had keistered away from the feds so long ago. And with that, he was out the door. Chapter 17. 
Billy and the Great Big Circus. The news ticker had said that the cyber circus was on Friday. Today was Sunday. Billy knew the chances were slim, but if the circus ran like anything else in the hub, it would be delayed at least until Saturday. If he were lucky, maybe, just maybe, the circus would have been delayed until today. He just might have enough time to catch the final act. For a moment, Billy shuddered to think of what things must have been like when they weren't efficiently run by a central planning committee. How could anything ever have gotten done? He urged his speeder onward, pushing 400 miles an hour, and then 405, 410, maxing the rickety old speeder out at 413 miles per hour on his way to the circus district. He knew he was asking a lot of the eye mover, but the lad had a show to catch. Billy took over manual controls and hit the off-ramp, going full speed. The thin, plexi-mesh bubble shook violently, but the pizza plate wheels held fast, so Billy bared down hard on the joystick and prayed to God. The speeder bucked and shucked and jived over the pockmarked asphalt at all points, threatening to come unhinged, but somehow holding together. He crossed his fingers, hoping his mad dash wasn't for naught. And it wasn't, because when he pulled into circus parking, the cyberdome was pulsing with light, and he could hear the dull applause of a far-off crowd. That clown must be working his magic, Billy thought spitefully. The plexi-mesh bubble of the city speeder had hairline cracks all throughout, and the pizza plate wheels were glowing red with heat. He pulled it briskly into an empty spot, and left it wide open and running. He looked down at his Omega watch and said a silent prayer to God. This better work, or I'm toast, Billy said. He pointed the watch at the ground and pressed a series of buttons. The watch blipped and blooped, showed the rainbow pinwheel briefly, and finally it spoke. Hollow mode engaged. A micro-projector on the platinum alloy bezel fired a thin blue holographic beam down at the dusty, trash-covered earth. It crisscrossed back and forth, slowly at first, building, building in speed until it finally moved so fast that the naked eye couldn't see it. When it had finished its operation, there at Billy's feet was a 3D-printed holographic hovering board. Billy hopped on and rode it through row after row of parked city speeders until finally he was at the circus entrance. The best part about hollow mode was well engaged, the watch doubled as a quark coin ASIC miner. In the brief moments it took him to surf, acro surf across the parking lot, Billy had made enough quark to pay for the entrance ticket. The main digital tent flap was manned by two intimidating bounty hunters. One of the bounty hunters was human albeit with so many cybernetic enhancements that he looked more like an erector set than anything that had ever come out of a woman's body. And the other was Brumalian or some sort of Tyria sector morphopod. He couldn't very much tell. The morphopod had long, poison-soaked talons and giant bug eyes. It was hard for Billy to decide which one was more lethal, but he made sure to give them both ample room. Billy handed over his ticket and submitted to a quick DNA scan. Last name Boy, first name Billy, middle initial H, male, age 12, gum dum. It all checked out. He took his ticket stub from the tufts and hurried inside. Under the big triple exomorphic nanodome, there was a highly advanced circus that combined olden days showmanship and bravado with new tech style, uh, new tech style and digital trickery. There was a giant e-elephant whose trunk could crack the strongest RSA encryption protocols. Cybernetically enhanced gymnasts swung from magnetic grappling hooks on spider steel ropes. The incredible Flamo used bioactive carbon neutral cold pyro gel to spray the crowd with huge blasts of fire that were no hotter than 17 degrees Celsius. The crowd oohed and odd as Flamo danced from side to side like a belly dancer and gave them the ultimate light show. <clears throat> Speaking of light shows, the entire inside of the dome structure was lined with TV viewports. 
Yikes. So if anyone got bored of the circus, they could opt to watch TV instead. Most buildings were like that nowadays, but it was a nice touch, something you don't see at many other circuses, too cheap to install viewers. Billy looked at these screens now as they played the nightly news. Seven killed by a car bomb, unfair racial rules, white race being too unfair and hogging all the goodies. Uh, Mario called Kobayon, both members of my family, which is the GovCom sponsored reality show. Everybody watches it. Called him a royal twat. And Nikiu got caught sleeping with Centrino's boyfriend Qualcomm, three more members of my family. All in all, it was a bad news day. There was one positive story, though. Earlier in the week, a poor Afra-happy friend student, obviously motivated by societal unfairness, caved in the head of some stodgy old white teacher with a brick. The Afra-happy friend student apologized and wrote a letter saying he would never do it again. But in the hospital, the stupid old white coot said something racially insensitive. There was a GovCom-wide outpouring of support for the afro happy friend youth and equally strong condemnation leveled at the whitey teacher. National AHF leaders concluded that this type of thing is just going to keep happening until all the whites are killed off, and the leaders of important universities and academic institutions agreed wholeheartedly. Thankfully, <clears throat> the asshole teacher had his career ruined and all his possessions taken away, and Billy smiled knowing that at least somewhere in the world, justice was being served. He pinched himself and bopped himself in the head a few times. He was getting caught up in watching TV as usual. He was here on a mission, and it was important to keep an eye out for the elusive clown. All his old memories came rushing back to him, good and bad. The instant he smelled those fresh, hot e-nuts, he looked around. With the exception of a few high-tech baubles and solar-powered gits and gizmos, he could easily have been sitting on the bleachers at the old circus, the one that had been the scene of his destruction so many years ago. Billy breathed deep and thought of his life all at once in totality. He took mental inventory of the cast of characters, the men and women who fucked him over and thrown him under the bus, broken his heart, and spit on him as he laid in the gutter. He tried to think of the people who'd helped him out along the way and shown him love at his weakest moments before realizing there were no such people. He thought of all the fateful turning points where he'd come to a fork in the road and blown it. His decision to buy a flat screen TV instead of investing in foreign stocks. The tattoos he'd gotten, homeward bound on his collarbones and a koi fish on the back of his hand both ensuring that he could never get a job as anything more than a ditch digger. If only, if only. Those two words, if only, were a theme in Billy's life. He'd said them hundreds of times, as there were indeed hundreds of opportunities that Billy could have capitalized upon to turn his life around. If only he'd been awake at the wheel. Standing here in the circus surveying the crowd, Billy was finally able to think about these things without judging himself without making himself want to puke because of how gay he is. His mission was so important that he was no longer capable of self-pity and bellyache. He was simply a tool of the mission. The mission was everything now. Billy threw himself into it as if it were a funeral pyre, sacrificing his personality and his ego in order to make himself a more effective agent. His cold eyes scanned the crowd. Chapter 18, Billy Watches the Big Amazing Cresto. Out came the announcer. He wore a green suit <coughs> adorned with red question marks, a pinwheel hat, big dollar sign glasses, and knee-high black leather, leather boots covered in metal buckles. He had a Bluetooth headset that picked up his voice and sent it to the house PA system. People of all gender identities, sizes, disabilities, and racial defects, welcome to the circus! In every corner of the cyber tent, there were explosions of light and color. 
tubes in the ceiling ejected giant snake-like streams of Febreze brand scented party foam. The foam smelled like fresh orchids and lavender, just like a toilet puck. It sprayed and sprayed until it filled every nook and cranny of the tent. Then it melted, leaving gooey blue deposits in people's eyes, mouths, armpits, and everywhere else. Everybody smiled and snapped their fingers, happy to be clean and smelling good now. The first act to come out was the amazing Cresto, the famous, disabled, racially challenged she-male lion tamer who was able to do amazing things despite her obvious setbacks. On the far east side of the tent, strobe lights illuminated a long red ramp that Billy hadn't noticed before. At the top, geisha girls did a little dance on their tiptoes and blew kisses at the crowd. The geisha girls jiggled covering their ugly smiles with big paper fans. Then they threw down ninja smoke bombs and were enveloped by a cloud of white smoke. The cloud was parted by the amazing Cresto's considerable girth, which, crammed neatly in a carbon fiber wheelchair, shot through the smoke and came barreling down the ramp at about 70 miles an hour. The wind whipped the big rat's nest on her head, and the speed was so intense that her eyes teared up. The bottom of the ramp wasn't quite flush with the dust and trash-covered circus floor. So, when Cresto's wheelchair hit it, the rear suspension compressed and rebounded with such force that it sent all 350 pounds of Cresto's big, plump body flying through the air and crashing into the dirt. This wasn't part of the show, but the crowd ate it up anyway. Turns out, even in an age of ultimate tolerance, the masses just couldn't get enough of fat slapstick. They pelted her with rotten fruit and hurled insults, and she looked quite pleased, simply glad to have all the attention. One man in the audience who had the good foresight to bring a portable pesticide sprayer now rose to his feet for this chance to use the thing. He doused her good, and everyone laughed because fat people have bugs. A group of ugly oriental lesbians trotted out with an elaborate rope pulley jig. They were the emergency team trained for just such a calamity, and they worked quickly to secure Cresto's body with high tensile strength ropes. Once she had been laced up to the satisfaction of the emergency team leader, the lesbians gave a good heave and soon had the plump performer back in her carriage. The amazing Cresto, the world's greatest disabled body-positive she-male lion tamer, punched a few commands into her wheelchair's digital interface. On the right side, a carbon fiber panel snacked open with a sharp mechanical sound. Inside was her aerogel-coated nano-whip, which she reached for now. The crowd was absolutely titillated. For watching Cresto work her magic with the whip was quite a treat. She wheeled herself to the center of the ring. Slaves pulled four great metal cages over so that their placement formed a cross with Cresto at the center of it. Inside the cages were lions, more majestic and regal than any Billy had ever seen, even on TV or in picture books or in digital pick books. These lions had giant manes of pure snow white, their bodies were coated in luxurious golden fur, and they had such an air of dignity about them that they seemed more like heavenly beings than creatures of this earth. Cresto flicked her wrist, and her nano whip soared through the air to sting one lion right between the eyes, killing it instantly and scorching the air all around in the process. The whip automatically retracted with an electric crackle and was instantly ready to strike again. Cresto paused to look at the whip settings in her app, just as she thought. The whip was set to maximum intensity. She must have forgotten to dial it back after the last show, as this was the setting used for the finale. With an elegant two-finger swipe, she dialed it back now, from 10.0 to 3.5. With the first lion dead, she would have to make sure to milk the remaining three for all they were worth. Though Cresto was kicking herself, for making a beginner's mistake, the audience was absolutely elated. Perhaps their positive reaction to her happy accident would convince her to rethink the show. 
starting off with a bang, seemed to get the crowd rocking right on time. She turned to the second lion and let loose a volley of vicious strikes. <laughs> the whip cracked and fizzled with 200,000 bolts. Many strikes fell upon the bars of the cage and upon the dusty earth, where they would send sparks flying and leave great black marks, respectively. But many more made it through the bars of the cage. Inside, the lion went mad with pain. Its magnificent coat was no defense against the high-tech nano-whip and the searing jolts it produced. And the excess electrical energy surging through the cage was causing it to heat up quite a bit. Soon, all his fur had been stripped away, and the naked lion was cooking alive like a rotisserie chicken. The people gleefully slapped their knees and popped popcorn into their mouths. But Billy, despite being quite the animal lover, wasn't paying attention. His thoughts, as always, were with the clown. Fuck you, Billy. Fuck you. Cresto was already deep into her third lion when Billy snapped too. This one, she had whipped so surly that the animal was in a frenzy, and it charged so fiercely at one end of the cage that the whole thing came toppling over. The latch on the top came undone, and everybody in the audience held their breath. Sure enough, out came the lion, furious and thirsting for revenge. The wise and quick-witted Cresto wasted no time. With a quick swipe and two-finger zoom, she accessed her Nano Whip control app in the settings menu. Double-tapped defense mode. The Nano Whip reeled in faster than lightning and coiled around her, forming a spherical shield. This measure proved to be unnecessary, however, because before the lion could make it halfway to her, Three bulky oriental lesbians stepped forward from the shadows, wielding steer AUGs and gun swords, and perforated the lion in a hailstorm of hot lead. They were top-level marksmen and had managed to avoid the crowd, crowd with their fire for the most part. <clears throat> Everybody went wild. Even Billy for a moment forgot about his mission and experienced sheer enjoyment and thrill. Yeah! Cresto lapped up the applause like a thirsty dog and gave the crowd plenty of, it, of time to adore her while she set up for the final lion trick. She reset the whip back to normal mode and jabbed a few more commands into her wheelchair control panel. Another carbon fiber panel, this time on the left side, snicked open with the speed and precision of a fine German automobile. She reached down and pulled up with her left hand an olive drab military style case, which she then set on her lap. She pressed her thumb against the holographic thumbprint scanner, and the case spoke. Thank you, Cresto. Identity verified. Case will open in three, two, one. Case opening now. <clears throat> Stand clear. Case open procedure. Inside, she could hear gears buzzing and whirring. There was a burst of steam from the seams of the case. Then it opened. Inside, there were six heat-seeking thermite whip tips. Chapter 19. Billy watches the great big lion trick. Oh! There was not a single seated bottom in the whole cyber tent now. The amazing Cresto's whip was whirling and zooming overhead, and everybody was on their tiptoes, reaching for the whip tip as it went by, hoping to be the lucky person to score the prize that day. Faster and faster, Cresto swung her whip, closer and closer to the audience, until finally Billy could hit, feel the heat and the rush of wind on each pass. The whip was set to the highest intensity possible, 10.1 and violent arcs of electrozap energy radiated from it. Cresto was a master showwoman, and she worked the crowd into a frothing, foaming hysteria. They were right in the palm of her hand. She pulled the whip in, and the lesbians formed a circle around her and the last lion. 
They all had Casio drum machines, which they tapped at steadily. Faster, then faster still, the lesbians worked up to a drum roll crescendo and then stopped. Aside from the dull hum of the idle nano whip, there was dead silence, and everyone in the audience became aware of Zizz's own heartbeat. Just when the tension was so high that it seemed impossible to stand, Cresto swung and sent the nano whip crashing into the lion cage. With an immense bang, sparks flew and thermite sizzled. Inside, the lion stood on two legs and walked like a human, perhaps out of desperation, perhaps out of some sick lion sense of irony. The bars of the cage constructed from special skyscraper steel that could withstand jet fuel fire, melted like ice cream, and the whole structure caved in, killing the lion dead. Needless to say, this was the most fantastic and amazing thing the audience had ever seen. They all removed their pocketbooks and wallets, and threw fiat money as well as physical light coins down into the ring as tribute. An old man declaring to no one in particular that he'd seen it all, used some pieces of junk from the floor to improvise a zip gun and killed himself, but not before killing his wife first with that same zip gun. Those in the audience who'd been recording the event with their eye recorders uploaded their footage to Measy Vids and were competing for ad revenue and views, as well as commenting, rating, and subscribing to other people's uploads. In the center of it all, Cresto sat with outstretched arms, receiving the crowd's love and using it to recharge her black soul so that she could live another day. Then, as quickly as it had all started, Cresto stood up out of her wheelchair and walked off. The announcer appeared. Thank you very much. Shemales and trannies, submissives and amputees of all ages. We hope you enjoyed yourselves and are very much looking forward to seeing you at the next Great Circus! The fanfare died down and people were confused, most of all Billy. Had this really been it? The great spotlights and strobe lights went off and the house lights came on. Their cold fluorescent glow sucked the magic right out of the room. People threw their tickets on the floor and started to pile out of the tent. Chapter 20 Billy's Big Panic The circus goers were lined up at the exits, but the exits weren't open. There was a din from the people talking amongst themselves that gradually grew louder and louder as they realized that they were stuck inside. Some wanted their money back, but most people would have settled for a way out at that point. Then, to make things worse, all the lights died completely, and the backup safety air raid sirens triggered automatically. Just a routine power failure. Happens all the time in my sector, the man next to Billy said, inches from his face, belching stinky cigar smoke. Billy felt a hand creeping up between his legs. <laughs> went the air raid siren. The body heat from a thousand panicked people in an unventilated space was oppressive. The moisture from their collective sweat was sickening, and combined with all the cigar and pipe smoke, it made Billy want to puke. The stinky breath came in close again. Don't worry, kid. We're going to get out of this just fine. I've been in plenty of jams. If anything bad happens, just stick with me and I'll show you what to do. <clears throat> the hand, presumably belonging to the man, rose higher and higher between Billy's legs, scratching and tickling him the whole time. He didn't know if he liked it or not, but until someone turned the lights on, there wasn't much he could do about it. Initially, Billy had hated the touch of a man, but over the years he'd grown so used to it that even the worst male touch was only a nuisance and sometimes an enjoyable distraction. Billy heard someone's tummy rumble. The voice of an older woman rang out. Oh, oh, God, I'm sorry, everyone. I just can't take it anymore. <clears throat> there was another rumble, followed by a ghastly fart. 
The wet sound alone was enough to make even a U.S. Marine beg for mercy. But soon after, the smell so thoroughly saturated the air that it felt as if the whole world were made of her shit. Her fart was in Billy's eyes, his hair, in his shirt, in between his toes, everywhere. And it was no different for the people around him. Hands reached out. Men and women staggered and clawed at the air, looking for something to catch their balance. Someone unloaded on Billy's shoes with lukewarm sick. The man with the pesticide sprayer was spraying for dear life. Men who had extra cigars on them tucked them neatly in each nostril, hoping in vain that somehow the tobacco would filter or mask the stench. It was a mess. <laughs> The air raid siren whooped for the last time, and then there was silence. In the darkness, men sat huddled, clutching their knees to their chests, and puffing quietly on their cigars and pipes. Billy had years of sewer plant experience to fortify him against such smells, but even he was still reeling after the acrid butt had died down. Thankfully, those in the crowd who'd gone into fits of mania had managed to calm themselves. The wounded tended to their wounds, and many made silent prayers of thanks to God. Evidently, there wasn't a power outage, because the announcer cleared his throat into his mic. Ahem. <clears throat> Sis and non sis are you ready? The confused crowd remained quiet. I said, are you ready? Before anyone could reply, there was a violent explosion of sound and color. The jock jam song blared over the PA loud enough to burst eardrums, and high-powered strobes and laser lights illuminated every square inch of the place. All around, jaws were on the floor and one by one the huddled people rose up with mixed feelings of astonishment and triumph. <laughs> the announcer was breakdancing and doing parkour so fast in the center ring that no human eye could make out all his moves. <clears throat> he did front flips, back flips, double back flips, all just as a warm-up. He then assumed a wide-legged karate stance and punched the air so fast his hands appeared to be one big blur. Oh, oh, you got this? He barked into the microphone. People in the bleachers were doing handstands, chewing their cigars and eating them, clenching their fists white-knuckle tight. The announcer then ran to the edge of the ring and waved his hand in a windmill motion several times before putting it up to his ear, letting the audience know that he couldn't hear them. They screamed so loud, it was unbelievable. But he mimed again as if he couldn't hear them. He made his face pouty and his eyes had a teasing glint in them, which drove the people to be even louder with their next scream. Finally, it was enough to satisfy this master showman, and he ran to the other side for a repeat performance. He then, he then started clutching at his arms and shivering, pretending to be very cold. Those who'd seen this act before knew what he wanted and obliged him, puffing fast at their cigars and pipes to warm him up. The announcer started to warm up a bit, soothed by the warming smoke of pipes and cigars, and made gestures for the rest of the audience to join in. Soon, everybody was taking fast puffs and blowing smoke towards him, as he laid casually on the ground with his hands behind his head like a sunbather. What a delight from this virtuoso crowdsman. He hurried to the center of the ring. <clears throat> 
short step sprinting and making fast hands like a football player. Off went the music, along with the lights again, except for spotlights, one from each corner of the tent, which swung over and beamed on him, as if he were God. To the east and to the west, shadowy figures scuttled about. They ran towards the announcer, and everyone could see that it was the two lesbians, each holding one glow stick. The lesbians knelt before the master of the ring and presented the sticks. The announcer snatched up the two small plastic rods and dismissed his attendants with swift roundhouse kicks to the ribs. The lights went out completely, and again, the tent was black. <clears throat> when the rabbit applause and cat calls subsided, <laughs> the announcer spoke. You folks, <sighs> he laughed, slightly out of breath. You folks, you thought the circus was over, didn't you? <sighs> there was no response, for their collective hypnosis was too deep to respond from. Instead, the people fixed their eyes on him harder and bit down on their lips. Well, guess what? Guess what? This little old show is just getting fired up. Yeah! The song Club to Death came on. With a spine-curdling crack, he snapped both glow sticks, causing them to burn with the green fire of twin alien suns. Then he simply stood, stood there like a statue as the dramatic violin intro part of the song played. The announcer jumped and spun and punched at the air with both sticks, creating beautiful green shapes that teased the eyes and defied logic. In perfect sync with the melody, he whirled these curious little luminescent devices through the air with the skill of an expert, giving people a light show such as they had never seen and will never see again. As the music worked its way closer and closer to a crescendo, he kicked and pumped the air more and more dynamically. The speed and force of his thrusts were matched only by their grace, and the green plasma traced a painting in the air that not even God could match. The announcer's face was hidden in the darkness, but he had tears in his eyes as he delivered his greatest work. Then came the piano solo. The crying announcer stopped his flamboyant gestures and let the glow sticks fall to the ground beside him. Very dim lights came on, barely enough to make out the features of his handsome, elegant face. But everybody in the audience could tell how the pure expression of art had rocked his body, and they were touched by it. The music faded, and he finally managed to compose himself enough to speak. Circus is never over, folks. 
you people go home, you go back to your lives. Once the big show comes to a stop, the grand theater closes its doors. But inside, the players, in here, he clutched at his chest. In here, the circus never dies. She males and trans men, I give you the clown. Billy had been moved by the announcer's little speech, but in the blink of an eye, the blood in his veins turned to ice. The blood in his veins turned to ice. He was no longer nervous, regretful, or angry. He just smiled. He smiled, perhaps the smile that only the clown himself could recognize. It was the smile of the mouth, but not the eyes. The eyes were frozen pools of molten lead, so hot they could freeze anyone caught in their gaze. The announcer pulled a zipper from the top of his head, and the green suit and pinwheel hat fell to the floor in one piece, along with his skin and hair. There, looking Billy dead in the eyes, stood the clown. Chapter 21. Billy's Last Stand. Billy couldn't tell for sure if the clown had indeed recognized him, or if he was just staring at Billy by coincidence. So much had changed over the years, and the lad had aged doubly fast from his hard lifestyle. The cute kid who didn't care much about anything except going to the circus was gone now, and in his place stood a hard scrabble, weary survivor. If the clown had indeed recognized him, Billy thought, then he would truly have to have had demonic powers. Meanwhile, the crowd was absolutely going bananas. The delight on their faces reflected what was in their hearts. They were witnessing a once-in-a-lifetime performance, and they all knew it. And if the announcer had a taste for, a, the, for applause, this new clown had a hunger for it. He skipped and did parkour all around the rings, absorbing the applause energy and rewarding the fans with killer moves. <laughs> Refresh your pipe, sir? A big-titted smoke girl asked Billy. She had a big tray of cigars, pipe tobacco, and hokum dogs slung around her shoulders. Billy looked down at her big tits, which were spilling out all over the confections. No, thank you. When Billy turned back to look at the show, an oriental lesbian was scurrying out with a tall glass of water, and the clown was halfway up a giant ladder. He kept climbing higher and higher until finally he had reached the top, almost able to touch the tent canopy. The ugly oriental lesbian deftly lit eight scented candles and placed them on the ground in a ritual formation with the glass. Men and women sat in hushed silence, waiting with bated breath for what they knew would be an amazing trip. And boy, was it. Even Billy had to hand it to him. The clown's next move was a showstopper. He did a quick MC Hammer dance back and forth across the platform at the top of the tent and jumped right off, free falling towards the glass below. The audience gasped. The clown seemed to hover in the air as he struck different poses and did an assortment of tricks. One second, he had the grace of a swan, striking a pose straight out of a ballet playbook. The next second, he was as sleek and aggressive as a T-25 strike throne. He flew 10 stories before finally assuming a belly flop pose, striking the glass at just the right angle, then disappearing inside with a big splash. There was no applause, because the people were all too dumbfounded to understand what they'd just seen. Then, inside the glass, somehow, the clown whirled his arm in a big windmill motion and brought it to his ear. The crowd erupted. Even Billy had to stand up out of his seat and clap for dear life. It goes to show, you can teach an old clown new tricks. And while Billy might not have liked this clown, 
he had to give him kudos and admit it was quite a trick indeed. The big, plump old sow who'd nearly killed the whole tent with her gaseous excretions was clapping frantically and wiggling so hard her clothes nearly came off. Billy would have expected an older woman dressed as nicely as her to have a bit more poise and dignity. But I guess once you fart in front of a thousand people, Billy thought, you can let yourself go in other areas as well, especially if you're a woman. She hooted and cried, Oh, fuck! Oh, fuck! What the fuck? What the fuck? Boy, she's really losing it, thought young Billy. But little did Billy know that he would be losing it soon as well. Once the fanfare had died down, big Afro-happy friend men wearing elegant bronze armor and helmets trotted out, wheeling behind them a cart overflowing with cream pies. As the people around him laughed and slapped their thighs, Billy felt his insides turn to a flaming block of ice, so hot it could freeze Mount Everest. <laughs> So hot it could freeze Mount Everest. There were pies. There were pies of every type on the cart. Shaving cream pies, whipped cream pies, skin cream pies, dairy cream pies, cookies and cream pies. Billy looked down at his Omega Speedmaster. He had mined enough cork coin to pay for a good meal, but the watch had overheated and was totally fried. Dang, Billy said out loud. I guess you can destroy an Omega watch after all. Looks like I'm on my own. He fixed his eyes back on the clown, who almost seemed to wink at Billy as he pulled himself out of the glass. Again, he heard the cruel clown calling to him from the past. Fuck. Fuck. You. Fuck. You. <clears throat> Everybody in the audience was wearing a dumb, greedy smile. The time had come for the great pieing. For some, it was the most entertaining part of their show. For some, it was the most entertaining part of their lives. And for many more, it was a rite of passage, more important than a bat or bar mitzvah. The clown took a few warm-up shots at his armor-clad assistants. Pick me! Me! Pie me! A young boy cried out from the far side of the tent. If he only knew, if he only knew what terrors he wished upon himself. Billy thought, but deep down, he knew the truth of the matter, that this young boy across the ring wouldn't be receiving a pie, because the clown never pied the brave. The clown only pied cowards, and Billy was a coward. He tilted his chin up and made his chest broad. He was on a mission, and he was no longer Billy. He was just the agent of the mission, there to ensure its success, and useless if it were to fail. It didn't matter if you were a coward or a little Nancy boy. It didn't matter if he was a plump little prince who'd been given everything on a silver spoon and thrown it away like a fool. He was going to make his stand here and now, because if he didn't, the whole universe just might implode. The clown whizzed around the tent, chucking pie after pie with mechanical precision, until pretty soon, most of the front row wore cream-covered smiles. But underneath those smiles was pure cold fear, because everyone knew that to not take a pie with the utmost stoic bravery was to be doomed. The pies all had razors and needles in them, and quite a few people lay face down on the ground and on the bleachers, nursing their injuries. For the most part, these people were just thankful that their pieing was over with but many of them silently cursed the clown and wished vengeance upon him. Maybe it was better that Billy didn't know this, for if he knew that there were others who felt this chilling sting of the clown, his own bloodlust would have been dulled by the feeling of camaraderie 
and he would have lived out the rest of his life as he had been living the past few years. As the clown made his rounds, making things creamy and giving everyone a good show, Billy lost his cool. He couldn't hold back the raw emotions anymore, and he began to blubber with an impotent rage, just as he had done so many years ago when the clown had stripped him of everything. Billy wasn't the general. He wasn't an agent on a mission. He was a stupid coward, an angry, sad, fucked up little mess, good for nothing and nobody. Petter learned that the hard way when back when Billy got him killed. What's that sound? A man with a cigar standing in front of Billy said. God, is that what the the man turned his head to look for the source of the willy weeping. When he saw Billy, the confused look on his face turned to anger. Kid, you're ruining the show. What the hell's the matter with you? Billy didn't respond, and the man became even more irate. He took a big puff of his cigar and then reached to extinguish the smoldering thing on Billy's shirt, giving him a good burn. But Billy just kept blubbering like a coward, staring at the clown. Fuck you, Billy! Fuck you! Look what you did, you little brat! You made my cigar go out! The man laughed now as he teased and tormented Billy. People in the immediate vicinity were starting to pay attention, and now there was a decent-sized circle around Billy and the cigar man, watching the little scene unfold. The cigar man poked at Billy's chest hard with two fingers. Billy, eyes red from crying, couldn't look away from the clown. You're fucking up my show, dude. See, you fucked the show up for me. How about I make you into a show? See what happens when you mess with an Italian? All around Billy, people were pelting him with eggs and spitting on his shoes. Some were polishing their steel-toed boots, getting ready to give him a good tap between the legs. The cigar man was loading a gun now, hoping that Billy would give him a good reason to use it. But in Billy's head, there were only two people in that whole tent. Just him and the clown. The clown was looking left to right, holding his hand over his eyes as if there were intense sunlight overhead, hunting for his next victim. When he locked eyes with Billy, time froze. If the clown was at all surprised at seeing Billy after all these years, he didn't take any extra time to show it. He crouched low and stalked toward Billy, pie in hand, like a wild predator. Reaching into his Timbuktu messenger bag, he pulled out a handful of razors and needles to give this pie a little something extra. Billy bawled and blubbered, and the nasty people around him continued to fling garbage at him and shout profanities. The man with the cigar egged on the clown. Hey, hey, Mr. Pie Guy, come over here and get this fucking kid good. Fucking blubbering coward, he's a fucking pasta primavera. Billy squealed and wriggled. There was no help in sight. His father, the general, was away at the Great War. His mother had a brand new little boy. No time to help old smelly Billy. Musty was put in a crusher after Billy got busted for street racing. Billy knew full well how Petter had met his demise. Billy was racking his brain trying to think of one person out there who still cared for him and loved him, but there was no one. If only the world's problems could be solved by crying, Billy thought. If only I had an army of generals at my side to protect me during my cowardly moments. If only I could have Einstein's brains in my big old lunk head instead of a bunch of moldy crab apples. If only, if only. There were those two sorry words again. The clown was upon him. The pie was a mere ten feet away, flying at him in slow motion. Was he damned to repeat this scene over and over again? If only, if only. Was the clown actually the devil? Was this hell? If only, blubbering coward, the general. His peripheral vision went black, but he saw the clown's gnashing yellow teeth with perfect clarity. If only, if only, mashed potatoes had, fuck you. 
the razors and needles gleamed from inside the cream pie. Albert Einstein had once said that the future of humanity was a boot stomping on your toes forever. But he was wrong. The future of humanity is a face full of razors and needles forever. He could hear Petter cursing at him now. Fuck you, Billy. He heard his father, the general. Fuck you, Billy. The soothing robotic female voice of Musty, his co-workers at the sewage plant, Bartholomew, his mother, all in chorus, all sounding like the clown now. Fuck you! The clown stopped dead, and the people assaulting Billy fell silent. He looked down at his feet. Somehow he was standing tall, and the tears had stopped flowing. The clown dropped his pie as Billy opened his mouth to speak. No. Fuck. You. The end.